August Granith and Ben Alter. Let's see. And so I think we should just jump right to it. I'm sure we'll have people join in as we come along, but I'll hand it over to you, August. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can folks hear me? All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me do one quick thing here. I'm going to try to pull up a slide really quick, if that's okay. Um, one second. Am I clear to share as a with um, as not a host? Uh, you should be. Let me know if it's not letting you, and I'll go in and change the settings, but I should be able to let you share. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I think I'm good to go. All right, can everybody see my screen here? Yep, we can see it, thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody for taking this time. Um, wanted to um, create a little bit of time with the commission um, to touch base specifically on two grants that we're developing. Um, one focused on kind of our diversification priorities. Um, that's gonna be the lion's share of what our um, kind of diversification spend will look like this year. And then another one um, that is smaller, that's already been approved um, and is kind of focused on tourism businesses. Um, but because they're both gonna be designed relatively similarly, we wanted to talk about them at the same time um, and get into all of that. Um, let's just fly into it. So just a quick overview of the plan for discussion. I wanted to add a little bit of a, a quick department update just so that everybody on here who might not be working with me on a board or in other kind of close parameters have an idea of what our office is taking on kind of in our new form um, to contextualize the grant programs that we're talking about today. Uh, I threw in a couple economic indicators from that I prepared for the Canyon Lens Business Summit that I thought would be interesting just for a general uh, context and then dive into those uh, grant programs, how we're thinking of putting them together, timeline for execution, et cetera, et cetera. And we should have plenty of time for discussion. And my goal is to try to make some very clear questions for the commission. Um, I'm sure there will be other things that will come up throughout the day. So just to do a quick department update, uh, we have rebranded a little bit um, as our office has shifted from being just a destination marketing organization and becoming an economic development office, um, we wanted to update the visual language that we use in email communications and um, the like. So Robert put together this new Grand County Economic Development logo um, that has, you know, the three main priorities of our office, tourism, business, and film. Um, that's something that we'll use kind of an interim, not really informed by community engagement or strategy, but a simple thing that we can start with um, to kind of represent the internal changes in our department. Um, and this is what we look like now. So on the tourism side, we have two assistant marketing directors, Robert Riberia, who's been here um, for quite a long time, and Melissa Stocks has been here for several years. Our holdovers from the Travel Council days and are continuing to do the tourism activities um, that I'll talk about in a second. Ben Alter, who was our VISTA last year and is on the call today and prepared a lot of this grant work, um, is now our full-time economic development specialist. On the film side, we brought over uh, Biga Metzner from the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission, which was in the city, jointly funded by the city and the county, is now fully in our office. And then uh, y'all might remember Mary Lou, who's now the deputy treasurer. Um, she was our administrative staff person. 
been a while without that role, which means that we've been um, really uh, having to take on a lot of different kind of unexpected work throughout our current staff. Um, so we actually wanted, wanted to announce we have a new hire for that position starting next Monday. Um, and we're very excited to get her onboarded and, and rolling as an office. And then we're going to hire another VISTA this spring um, as well to kind of help build out some of the diversification and data work that our office is taking on. Some department-wide projects um, that are budgeted and prioritized are um, a master plan for our office and for um, economic development in general. I think something to keep in mind throughout today is that we are kind of putting the cart before the horse this year in a lot of ways in that we're doing our best to make, um, you know, educated, informed decisions on what our office should be doing this year, but we haven't done an extensive, you know, community engagement process, bringing the commission stakeholders together, bringing um, business and community stakeholders together to make sure that, you know, our office is really functioning in the best way possible and prioritizing the right things. And that'll be a natural build out as the general plan and strategic plan are finalized by the county. Um, but just wanted to flag that, you know, we don't really have very clear guiding principles as an office. Something else is in terms of data and research, we have um, trying to build out our internal data warehouse and ability to analyze those things. Um, as currently, we don't really have a staff person dedicated to that. And then we also want to build a public facing dashboard that'll kind of come out of the master plan so that the community is better informed, um, A, about the data that we have and um, about our goals and comparing that to the actual data on the ground. And then lastly, internally, our CRM, which is kind of what we use to um, track business engagements and those kinds of things we're building out internally to kind of improve our processes. We have three boards we work with, the Travel Council Advisory Board, um, which has been around for a long time. They're focused on tourism priorities and advises on our TRT expenditures. There's the Economic Development Advisory Board um, that is statutorily required to engage in the Rural County Grant Program, which last year funded um, business grants, co-working space, uh, child care facilities, and we got a big uh, $300,000 grant for housing at Arroyo Crossing through that kind of group. And then this year, very much focused on housing and child care as priorities and working with that, that body. And then there's the Economic Diversification Advisory Council, um, which is going to be focusing on these business grants and kind of diversification business grants, um, as well as workforce development throughout this year. They're going to be, these, all these boards, we're going to start to meet, um, make the updates necessary to have them meet monthly, kind of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the second week of the month. So that our office is kind of streamlined in how we approach planning and um, kind of monthly sprints for these kinds of things. Because um, it's kind of a lot of work to coordinate all these different people. Um, the one context for diversification related work is that we do need to get the ball rolling before um, the master plan is in place, given the five year sunset on the diversification funding in TRT. So just a reminder of what we do as an office in general, we provide visitor quick, services. August. So, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not that educated on the actual like language and the TRT. What do you mean by the five-year sunset? So what, this is pretty common from my understanding of it when, when the Utah State Legislature creates new um, kind of funding streams or tax rules. Um, that they'll put a sunset clause in it, which basically mandates a review um, in the legislature five years from the time that that legislation is enacted. And so a good example of this is the state changed their TRT, their state TRT rules um, for the statewide tax they collect that provides the outdoor recreation grant um, that they do that's funded the uh, the boulders at Lions Park and Takeout Beach renovation project. Um, and they this year would be year four and Rep Representative Albrecht ran a bill that basically eliminated the sunset clause in that legislation. So what that means is 
we have to be prepared to show the the impacts of the diversification spend. And we're going to have to start now in order to see those impacts before that five years is up. I think, I think for me, a goal would be to run a similar kind of bill where in four years we've shown impacts and we can convince the legislature that we don't need this sunset. We don't need this mandatory review. This is an awesome program that's benefiting our community and, um, you know, not go through that process. Does that, does that clarify? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Chris Baird knows more than me on that, but that's kind of my synthesis of the context. And my understanding is we're one year in on that five years at this point. Um, so kind of our, the, the operations that our department has done and continue to do um, are maintain the Discover Moab website. We answer phone calls that are routed through the Moab Information Center. We answer emails through the info at Discover Moab email speak with in-person visitors that think that we're the Moab Information Center. Um, we produce and mail travel planners, um, and we maintain locator boards in downtown Moab, or at least part of them, um, to provide visitor information. We also do communications, so that's social media um, through a variety of accounts and platforms, and we do kind of email messaging, mostly internal, um, to let uh, our community know kind of what we're what we're up to. We also do um, travel to trade shows and conferences, including stuff like Tourism Day on the Hill, legislative advocacy work, um, and Go West in Reno, which is educating basically bus tour operators about kind of what's going on in Moab and what we want, what kind of messaging do we want to communicate to those businesses and, their, and therefore their visitors. So this year, Melissa went to Reno and talks to so uh, an endless number of people wondering how the time entry system was going to work and affect their business. Um, so it's kind of just an essential operation for being in touch with the industry. In terms of ad spend priorities this year, um, we've been coordinating with a handful of local, state, and federal um, stakeholders to make sure that the time entry system goes well. And you know, through our communications and research focus. So, you know, the first of that is a digital marketing campaign. Um, we issued an RFP and we awarded it to Love Communications. Um, we're still working on the contract to get that started, but we're starting to do the internal work on that. The intention is to um, place ads online targeting people who are likely to visit the park, who are already interested in visiting the park, and providing them with, you know, information about the fact that a reservation system is coming to avoid the inevitable crush of the day of who are upset with this new change. Um, so we've been doing that. Via, we're, going, we're going to launch that digital campaign here in March. Um, we're also going to be doing physical signage at those locator boards and on kind of highway side, UDOT style um, uh, billboards, north and south. Billboards is the wrong word, but you know, safety, um, messaging signs north and south of Moab on 191 and east and west of the exit on 70. And then we're also doing business engagement and providing rack cards that have all that information as well as outdoor adventure guides for when people would like to do something else while they're waiting for their um, reservation slot. And we're working with local businesses to make sure that they have all that information. On the research side, we're also working with the Utah State University National Park Service and the Utah Office of Tourism to kind of evaluate the impacts of time entry and also plug into a larger understanding of really what is the visitation dispersion impact frequency in the larger Grand County recreation ecosystem beyond each of the individual land management boundaries. Um, I think that's going to be really important, especially if this federal bill that I sent out to the commission happens, that's going to encourage kind of multi-stakeholder engagement in um, high visitation national federal lands and the impacts on our local communities. So I'm really excited about that work as well. Um, in terms of the Utah Office of Tourism's co-op grant, um, there's two um, from around 2020, which was that fly-in visitation marketing, um, basically encouraging people to 
fly into Moab and and therefore you know not bring all their toys and rent and and buy food and uh, take guides and outfitters and spend nights in hotels. A higher quality of visitation from a dollars and cents perspective, and then we also work with Utah.com um, to place articles basically about responsible recreation in Moab. This is bolded because the Northern Utah Midwest Fly-In is money we have. We have a $150,000 grant um, from the state, and we plan we have plans to spend 150 grand from our office in conjunction with that money. The the original plan is similar to last year, you know, targeting those fly-in visitors. Um, that's something that we haven't started. We haven't issued an RFP for, um, and it's something that I think we need to talk about, but is not my goal to talk about today. I wanted to flag it because that was something that was kind of flagged during the pre-authorization list discussion. Um, I don't know if we have time to do that and to talk about grants today, but I think, you know, that is something we should schedule for a later time, unless there are any quick questions on that right now while I'm on the page. I guess I hadn't seen the, the Northern Utah being part of that in previous discussions, but it sounds like that's something we're going to discuss later. Yeah, it's not really the goal for today, but um, okay. I'm just doing a quick overview of kind of not kind of a quasi department update to kind of contextualize what we're talking about so that we so that, you know, y'all can start thinking about, OK, this is something I need to follow up with August or we need to schedule a commission workshop or otherwise to discuss in the future. Um, that leaves a little less than $100,000, and that might be eaten up by other little corners of budget, but towards focusing on kind of responsible recreation marketing. Um, we've talked about doing targeted social media, um, partnering with people who have large followings and trying to communicate um, Moab area specific kind of travel tips and recommendations that are kind of what we want visitors to see. Um, rather than whatever they find um, organically. But that hasn't also, that hasn't really been fleshed out yet. In terms of grant programs on the tourism side, the event advertising program, which has been around for a long time, originally kind of startup cash to develop new events, um, you know, was successful enough that it got moved to a shoulder season thing, you know, not so much prioritizing um, events when it's already busy. I think a good example of that is the Moab Folk Fest came through this process and is now an established and very successful um, November event. Um, and it's also supported kind of Moab Music Festival when they've been doing off-season off stuff like the Winterlude. Um, and it also supports community um, events such as the Summer Concert Series. This year, planning to kind of run it as, as designed um, and kind of reevaluate really what are the goals of this program in the future. And if we need to separate kind of the community funding, community event funding from kind of event development type funding. Uh, something that is new that we're going to talk about today is the small tourism business marketing grant. So the idea here is that, you know, we have some smaller mom and pop shops that can't really compete with the larger corporate tourism businesses in our area um, because they don't have a marketing budget or not that because they don't have a marketing budget, but we want to support those smaller kind of newer, different um, businesses with some kind of marketing grant funding, which they would not have and cannot compete with some of the bigger companies in town. Otherwise there's details and, and goals to be fleshed out there later today. And then lastly, um, we did set aside, I believe, 40 grand here for kind of general recreation film and convention resources that is not advertising required. So the idea is that we have some flexibility um, within those priorities to help support um, those kinds of things outside of like an event grant. Um, and that hasn't been dedicated to anything, but, you know, flagging that for, for the group. Lastly, and this is really the focus of our new hire, is this regulatory and compliance element of our admin position, um, which has been coming up recently. Um, special event permits is a big process, and we haven't had dedicated staff for that really since November, since Mary Lou left. 
So we are hiring um, someone new who's starting on Monday who will be managing this process, moving it to the e-approval platform, which is going to streamline things and we hope really make it um, a smoother process, process for applicants. Because right now it's a very high touch process um, and it's taking myself and Mallory a lot of time that we really should be doing on other things. But we're excited about that. Um, and then on the short-term rental and TRT compliance side of things, the, our new hire is going to manage that as well. And one of the first priorities is to review the software options that are out there, including what we've already have a contract with and work with a kind of a committee of folks involved in that process um, in order to move forward with the new vendor and have really good um, data there to understand what our short-term rental market looks like, um, does it line up with our TRT receipts and um, kind of twin compliance and also informing how we're treating short-term rentals and, and um, engaging with them as a, as a government. I think ideally we'd want to integrate that with the Title V adjustments that um, our attorney is working on and making sure that those are working synergistically with each other. Moving to the business side, today the big discussion is about our local organization expansion grant. Um, that's gonna take uh, about 50% of the, that diversification bucket this year. Um, and we'll talk about that later. Another big development is that we were trying our best to move forward with placing a year round full-time position um, at the USU, at the new USU Moab campus to provide um, technical business assistance at the Small Business Development Center there. Um, historically, it's been a part-time position and um, we're trying to basically back fund that so that it can be a full-time competitively paid uh, position to provide long-term enduring support to our communities um, here in Moab. And we're waiting on a job description and an MOU from USU, but we think that's moving forward nicely, and that will come to you once uh, there's kind of an actual proposal to review from USU. The business summit um, is in the rear view for now, it took place on February 7th. We think it went great. We are kind of wrapping that up in terms of the financials and um, uh, kind of pulling from people who are there and what went well, what went not so good, so that we can you know, make it even better next year. Um, other priorities kind of in our economic development diversification stream of business um, that we're going to be coordinating with boards to develop is, you know, more housing, more child care, workforce development, entrepreneurial development, and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so those are things that, you know, either have little bits and pieces, we haven't really sat down and, and thought about how is our office in conjunction with our boards and our community going to try to spend county resources to address these important issues that affect our economic ecosystem. Lastly, on film, I think we're all aware of the Rural Film Incentive Bill, SB 49, um, that if passed would really dramatically increase film production in Grand County. Um, that has already increased the amount of time that BEGA has been scouting as, as kind of film industry folks are looking at the Moab area with the potential to shoot stuff here if that passes. Um, and there's going to be more discussion there, but, but mainly just wanted to mention that that's on our minds and that Vega is fully moved out of the mark um, besides some storage and in our office when she's not out scouting and, and doing other work. We're really excited to have that as a part of our larger vision as an office is those, those three film, tourism business film. I guess before, uh, just three quick slides on kind of economic indicators. Any questions about how our department is functioning, operating, staffed, working on? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to thank you. And, and I'm very impressed with your, your grasp of the structure and, and sort of your, your vision moving forward as, as, you, as presented. Thanks, August. Thanks, Gabe. Yep, it's definitely a big task, but we're we're working it out and growing new limbs every day. Um, okay, so this I prepared for the um, business summit, and it's kind of the intention is to do a quick kind of quantitative look at, you know, what happened before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and then last year as we came out of it. 
kind of just from a general economic health standpoint. Um, this data at the time was the most up to date. So this is all for Q2 of 2019. So um, if I get this right, that's April, May, June. Is that right? January, February, March, April. Yeah, April, May, June. So, you know, height of the spring tourist season, things are in swing. I think it's a, you know, a relatively full employment time in our community. So in 2019, during those months, we saw visitation at Arches and the 600,000 amount. Um, payroll was about 55 million for the entire county. And um, employment was about 6,585. During uh, the pandemic year that followed, uh, visitation arches decreased by 70%, payroll decreased by 12%, and employment dropped by 22%. And that employment and payroll was almost exclusively within the tourism industry. Uh, back, these percentages are relative to that 2019 base year. But basically, this is indicating that we've kind of fully recovered, something that we all know intuitively, but that we fully recovered from the pandemic and then some. So visitation outgrew that base year by 5%. Payroll increased by 22% from that base year and employment is up 5% from that base year. So, you know, a fairly healthy, hot economy, generally speaking at this aggregate general number, just something to keep in the back of the mind as we're having these conversations. Um, let's dive into grants. I hope that wasn't too much information. Um, I just think it was important to kind of get an idea of what we're all working on and that this is kind of diving into one little corner of it. All right, so the high level overview is that there are two grants that we're gonna talk about today that, we're, that I've been working with Ben and our um, boards to kind of develop over this last several months. The first and most significant is what would be the spearhead of our diversification priorities and efforts this year. So we budgeted $500,000 for this in the 2022 budget. Um, and you know, I put it on the pre-authorization list, but it was not authorized, I think for good reason. It's a big significant program and we wanna have a larger discussion of really what's in there. Um, it's gonna come out of that diversification section of TRT. And the stated goal that we've kind of come up with at this point is to shorten the gap between wages and the cost of living for local residents while addressing the need for an increasingly resilient and diverse economy. That's pretty big and we'll dive into that in a moment. Again, kind of this context of that five-year sunset. The other program, and I think it's important to put it in the context of trying to provide services to larger the entire, all of the businesses that we have in our ecosystem um, and trying to give something, you know, to everybody at some level. So having a small tourism business marketing grant um, out of the tourism promotion section of TRT, again, um, and this is much smaller, so it's about a tenth in scale, so $55,000. This was recommended by um, the GM of the Hoodoo, kind of with this notion that, you know, the Hoodoo has this corporate marketing resources and that smaller shops can't really compete with that um, in terms of market share, and that it would be good to support our small locally owned tourism businesses um, by providing or supplementing a marketing budget. So that's the starting point. Uh, in terms of timeline, this is kind of what we're thinking for both of these. So this is the county commission workshop stated here today. We're gonna bring this to the open house on land use um, this Thursday, just to have conversations with the public if they come to our table. We're gonna bring it to our board um, next week. So the Travel Council Board meets on Tuesday of next week and the Diversification Board meets next Thursday or Wednesday. And then after we kind of get feedback from this group and from those boards, um, come back and huddle and make, make changes and then try to provide some draft program to the public during the week of March 21st to 25th to get input from businesses who would potentially apply for these and get an idea, like if this is reasonable, smart, feasible, if this makes no sense to them, what kinds of things should be changed, could be changed. Um, and then bringing it back 
to the county and the boards for review in early April with those feedback um, kind of incorporated with the goal of launching the grant program in terms of here's actually what the final design is going to be in May, doing in-person um, sessions for applicants and recording and circulating a webinar so that people have an idea of what's in there. The idea is that that gives people kind of two months to get familiar and start to develop ideas with the actual application portal opening July 1st and closing at the end of the month. Um, and then we would convene a scoring committee in August and disperse those grants in September. Something that's kind of important is um, with that new SBDC rep up at USU, that position is going to be um, the more that we can utilize and partner with that group, um, the better. And so one thing that we're going to be doing is requiring all applicants to meet with that new position there um, to understand basically basically as a, a somewhat of a vet vetting mechanism so that they get an idea. They talk to someone who can say, this is good. You should shift this or focus on this. It'll provide um, kind of assistance on how to apply for the grant or um, if, if if people kind of know already what they're doing, that they can just send them on their way. And also make sure that there's other, if there's other resources available for that kind of project, that um, they're made available to that, that applicant and they're not just siloed in our grant program. The other thing is that um, as we're going to provide a lot of the backfill funding for that position um, in this first year, the better numbers that they get in terms of businesses you know, started or contacted, grant money received, et cetera, they'll get more grant funding from the state and our their reliance on our, our funding to run that program will decrease over time, the more effective it is utilized. Um, and I kind of mentioned this already. In terms of a scoring committee, um, we want to create um, an independent panel. So we want to create some separation between our office um, and the actual applicants. We want to be able to coach and, and bring this information to applicants, but we don't want that to kind of be, come into the actual evaluation of applications. Um, and, you know, I'll probably have my favorite applicants and I, I, I don't want to bring that to the process. So the idea is that we'd have one county commissioner, a community nonprofit representative, a community business representative, and then another community representative, either either this is a decision point for the commission to think about um, either making it explicitly a city kind of representative, a USQ or other educational organization representative, or just wide open funnel for anybody to kind of be involved with. And then um, to kind of build awareness and good faith with the governor's office, um, working with one of their um, staffers in the Center of Rural Development to also um, kind of put input on this. And I think besides just having their expertise, that'll help us when it comes to um, state legislator review. You know, if we've engaged the state and they think that these, these awards are, are judiciously warranted uh, or awarded, excuse me, I think that'll be good. Um, there might be phases to it. There might be a, you know, interviewing for the larger grant amounts, um, but they're going to be scored on um, explicit criteria that we'll dive into in a second. General questions that we'll go over, you know, kind of basic stuff. What is your business name? Uh, what is the amount of the funding request? Where do you live? What percentage of your business is conducted in Grand County? Um, that'll be asked of either program, just general information. Um, and then I'm going to dive into specifics for each program. Any, any kind of like quick questions on the high level stuff? that's going to apply to either grant program. Maybe here, I mean, this is where I'm really asking for input specifically for a scoring committee. Um, any thoughts on uh, narrowing the filter on that position? We can also come back to this after we've reviewed everything. I, I would say that I, I'm partial to a, a Moab city representative in this case. Um, seeing as that the city doesn't have an economic development department um you know this could be a way of building um 
you know, building that relationship in this regard and, and you know, potentially open the, open the door moving forward to, to future collaboration and even uh, resource sharing with the city uh, with regards to economic development. Awesome, okay. I, I'm, I, I like that. Any other kind of feedback on that particular point, uh, commissioners? Um, I would just say it makes sense also to me that USU would be representative because of their extension service. Yeah, a good point. I will I will mention that when I was talking to Leanna, she's been on some of our grant awarding boards and explicitly asked to not be involved in any kind of grant awarding because she felt a little conflicted about making those types of decisions. Uh, Maybe that's the same as like your office where they're coaching and. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I'd be happy to just move forward with that as a city representative, unless there's dissent on that. Yeah. I like the city representative also. I think that's I think great. It's a good idea. Okay. All right. I'll just make a quick note of that. Would the, would the business representative be someone like from the Chamber of Commerce or, or just someone from the business community chosen? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel the need to explicitly make it like a chamber right. um, lens. I think if it's basically like probably a business owner um, in the community of any kind. So could be chamber member, could not be. I think that we would, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's okay to be relatively open, but just having some of that expertise in terms of actually owning and operating a business in our community. Absolutely. Um, maybe this is obvious. Are nonprofits um, eligible to apply for this diversification grant money? Yes. So we, we thought it would be prudent um, to open this to all organizations, especially if we're trying to prioritize kind of diversification. I think a lot of the, the thinking around this program is that this is kind of a research project. It's kind of a research pilot in a lot of ways. You know, we're going to find out what types of organizations are out there looking to expand um, that already exist in our community that we might not know of otherwise. Um, and that everybody kind of has an even playing field when it comes to the metrics. Um, if you can provide the outcomes we're looking for, then you're welcome to apply and, um, you know, bring your project to the table, which is why we called it a local op organization expansion grant rather than you know a business grant or something like that uh, i'm gonna move on if that sounds good so let's dive into the local organization expansion grant uh some context just on the diversification side as we're thinking about goals um is that um, I wish I had done this with all my, all my slides, but here we go. Uh, you know what we have, what the county has already done on this is draft a resolution that established the Diversification Advisory Council and adopted the Economic Diversification Action Plan um, in January of last year as a quote accurate overview of the co current barriers to economic diversification and broader community development needs. Um, this is out of date. Funds have been allocated. And this is just what's in that resolution. So whereas Grand County wishes to shorten the gap between wages and a cost of living by creating, attracting, and growing higher paying job opportunities for its residents, whereas um, the County Commission recognizes the need to provide a clear direction and measurable goals and objectives for staff, and um, identified the need for the the, the diversification group to review existing and future ordinances, um, kind of focusing on this land use element. So just kind of wanted to ground the group in, in uh, what y'all have already done. So this is really the goal statement as currently written. So yeah. it's to shorten the gap between wages and the cost of living for local residents while addressing the need for an increasingly resilient and diverse economy. Um, 
This is the language that kind of guides the diversification funding programs funded by the diversification carve out of transient room tax funds must be spent on, quote, an economic development activity that is reasonably similar to supplements or expands any economic program as administered by the state or the governor's office of economic opportunity. Um, so in some ways, we modeled this after a program that they already created um, at the state level that basically, you know, provided here's some, here's a grant program, here's a grant, you know, buy a machine, increase your productivity, hire a new person above county median wage. Um, I believe it was called the Ready Grant. Um, if I'm getting that wrong, I apologize. There was something like that. And so we kind of, that was in the back of our mind as we created this to kind of make sure that we had some backup when it comes to um, statutory requirements. So the, the intention is basically to provide um, free capital to businesses, um, allowing them to invest in improvements um, or organizations, I should say. Um, improvements that boost productivity, creating um, you know, increased profits, profits that can be invested in workforce opportunities, um, whether that's increased pay, more benefits, et cetera, have to be compliant with the TRT code. And here's the answer to your question, Sarah, all businesses, nonprofit organizations would be eligible. But it's not, I think we wanted to mention this, is that this program, as currently written, isn't explicitly targeting workforce availability concerns or kind of housing cost concerns um, in our community. I wanted to flag that because those are such big issues in our community at the moment. Um, but that's not exactly how this is designed to work. And if we want it to be designed to work on those things, we'd have to kind of change the design of the program. Um, as written, and I have four larger metrics for evaluation. So in terms of impact, stuff we've come up with is, does your project increase um, the pay or pay rate for your existing employees? Does it increase benefits provided to employees? Does it increase the revenue that you receive or services provided by your organization? Does it create new jobs created um, at 110% of county median wage, which is as of Q3 of 2021, $3,568 per month, um, pre-tax, not benefits. Um, and that's per month, which comes out to, for context, let's see, that's 892 a week or, 22.30 an hour. So just for context of what that number lands at, if you're looking at 110% of county median wage as of the most recent data we have. Something else we could consider is industry wage. So, you know, basically saying, okay, you're in this industry, maybe that's a better measure of, of impact. Um, and we do have some statistics that we could dive into for those industries. Maybe I'll hold off on that for now, but we can look at that later um, just to get an idea of what those numbers look like. Or kind of an investment in workforce training. Are, are you able to um, really develop your, your team and your capacity to do good work um, as an outcome of this program? Uh, and then there's this diversification focus. So, you know, rather than putting a um, exclusion up front and saying, well, you're in this industry, you can't apply. Basically asking the question, you know, how does your project, your business expand economic activity um, in a diversified way? And I think the question would be is, you know, do we look at the industries that are out there and define desirable or targeted? Or do we leave it kind of um, open to interpretation and see what comes in? And then, you know, as this is a one year kind of pilot program as, as currently designed, how achievable is your project that you're applying to work on? And does the, um, is there a potential for longer term impact than just, um, well, you just spent this money, it, you spent it on employee wages, and now next year, they're back down to normal. You know, how does this create long term impact? And then um, wanting to consider um, you know, ownership by or employment of members of socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, 
um, to kind of add that diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to this grant program. And then some specific application questions would be, you know, what is the project? How much are you asking for? What are the estimated costs associated with the project with a kind of a budget? And what is your timeline? The other part is we kind of tried to imagine what would it look like if we broke that $500,000 into manageable chunks for different types of organization sizes and kind of a way to think about it that we came up with to model it would be, you know, you'd have 20 small awards in that zero to $5,000 range, four medium awards in the $5,000 to $25,000 range, and three large awards in a $25,000 to $100,000 range. So this kind of, for larger businesses that a larger kind of inflection of capital A is warranted and B would be impactful and useful, there's something for them. And then for a smaller one person operation who could have a meaningful impact with a, a couple thousand dollars to buy a new piece of uh, machinery or, or whatever, what have you, that would be a useful um, kind of structure there. But it wouldn't have to be exactly those amounts for exactly, um, yeah, depending on what we see, it could, it could shift around. But that's just kind of a helpful look at how I would think we would distribute that money. Uh, stipulations that we've put in here would be that they'd have one year from disbursement date to spend the grant and provide us a report on how it was spent and re related impacts. Um, we wouldn't advertise this, but we would offer extensions if there's extenuating circumstances, if they can't spend the money, et cetera. And then um, the way we wanted to structure this is very similar to state programs where you, the, oh, an awardee would receive 90% of those funds up front and then 10% um, upon kind of completing a final report or a reporting requirement. So that way, you know, there's something that is helping them actually fill out the report and do the follow-up that we really need to get those, those metrics, um, but providing the lion's share of the funding up front to, to you know, induce those impacts. We want to provide a match, um, or we want applicants to provide a match to ensure that they have, um, you know, enough skin in the game up front um, so that we're not, you know, supporting organizations that are really pie in the sky and, and um, kind of don't quite exist or, or aren't going to be able to hit the ground running. So the idea with tiering this over so that smaller group of zero to $5,000, um, doing a 10% match, which is how we would do the um, tourism marketing grants. And then for the larger amounts in those um, bigger groups, it'd be a 20% match. And we would want that match to be 50% cash, and then it could be 50% um, of any of the following materials and supplies, services, um, donated labor, donations, or other grants that they want they could use to match the program. So for this grant, there's a couple questions that I want to pose, which really number one is, are we on the money when it comes to the goal? And contextualizing that within the larger operations of our office. Um, and you know, it's been brought up: is there is, is there a competing interest between trying to focus on these kind of wage-oriented metrics, where okay, we're trying to increase um, the amount of money people are making, providing year-round jobs in our community so that we have better livability? Um, does that compete with the interest of kind of expanding? diversified businesses. Um, and those things exist in the same grant or does, does it need to be kind of like one or the other? And therefore that would impact how we are developing our evaluation criteria. You know, how are we defining a targeted industry? There's a couple other things here, but I think that's the biggest question. Um, and I don't know, do we want to kind of mull over this now or go over the other grant and kind of come back to this? Um, I think I think working on this one first would be better than going to the other one. Okay. I was just going to say the same. So thing. I guess to clarify, um, you know, in working with uh, Emily Campbell and Gabe on um, through our diversification group, 
you know, Emily really clarify, wanted, wanted, wanted to ensure that we kind of were clear headed about what are our goals and, and are we actually focused on, on them when we're creating this grant? What are we trying to optimize for? Is it increasing, are we inducing an increase in wage in our community? Are we really focused on increasing the number and, you know, viability of kind of non-tourism or diversified businesses um, in our community or can it be both? I think that's the real question here and kind of something that I need guidance on from the commission, really. It is in some ways competing. You know, it's, uh, but they also go hand in hand. I mean, why do we want to expand low paying jobs? So, but so I like the idea that we're focusing on wages because in a sense, then that means that the type of businesses that we would be expanding would be businesses that uh, are higher paying businesses. And I do think those are the type of businesses we want to expand. We don't want to expand the lower paying businesses. Um, so when you look at it that way, it's not competing because by focusing on the wages, we are in a sense eliminating those businesses that uh, their business strategy is having low paying jobs. Uh, so I'm, I'm not helping at all yeah. here, but I do, I think no, no, wages no, I think are, excuse me, go ahead, August. What'd you say? No, I, I was just saying, I think, I think that's a really good point, which is that, you know, if you're optimizing for wages, if that's really our goal is to increase the number of high paying jobs in our community, you know, wherever we can get that, we'll take it. Right. Yes. Yes. So and anyone else? I, I guess I was wondering if, if you could provide examples of, you know, the kind of grants we would, I mean, I don't know if there were specific things you had in mind when you were writing this criteria. And, and I think, I think it'll be helpful in this conversation, but it would also be helpful for people who are potentially applying for grants, just to give some examples of the, the range of things that you were considering. Yeah. Um, so I think at the starting point, a lot of this was around this kind of like idea of, of light manufacturing. Um, as like a, as a conceptual starting point, you know, thinking about the fact that we have all of these kind of smaller um, artisan goods or product makers in our community um, that make really high quality stuff that is, um, you know, doesn't require someone to come in person um, to a retail storefront um, and is basically kind of an export out of our community. Um, and providing capital for them to increase, you know, buy a machine, build a outbuilding, uh, increase the productive space that they have so that they can hire and invest and train new people um, to kind of grow that corner of their business. But I don't think it's limited to just kind of like manufacturing. Um, I think it could be you know, talking to uh, nonprofit organizations that also need to expand and provide services, but that are providing good paying jobs as a part of um, what they're doing um, in their normal operations. So those are the kinds of starting points that I'm thinking about. Other things that are not so clear, but I think could make sense um, if we want to go down this, rat this kind of rabbit hole is, you know, if I'm going to sign up with a hundred thousand dollar grant and say, well, I'm actually going to match this more so, and this is going to help me buy a house to house employees. And therefore it's going to allow me to hire way more people. Um, to me, that would seem like a, a reasonable way to go. Um, based on the way we've defined it, that would be a, certainly an eligible application if you could justify it. But those, are, those, these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about at the moment. And it's, it's currently very unclear, right? So 
Does that kind of help think about the range of possibilities that we're thinking about? Um, yeah, it helps some. I mean, I, I think your first class of examples with the light manufacturing and maybe, maybe buying some equipment, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, for, for the nonprofits, I'm just want. I mean, I, I'm assuming what you don't want to do is if someone says, hey, you know, give me $25,000 and I'll just pass it straight through to my employees, thus, you know, boosting them above the median wage for as long as the grant lasts. Um, so what what kind of longer term things could nonprofits do to to sort of accomplish the goals of these grants? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think that, that that's kind of that investing in, in workforce um, kind of quality of workforce um, or expanding kind of capital expansions that, that, you know, basically they have services that they need to provide, but they're limited by the space or capacity that they have. And if they can increase their capacity, they can get grant funding to fill those, um, you know, service provision positions, but, you know, they're limited by the, the, the capacity that they currently have to provide those services. You I know, think of, of in this nonprofit um, conversation, I think of the kitchen at the Youth Garden Project that required a huge capital investment and actually provides for the diversification opportunities for the entire community. Um, so I see something like that fitting in really well with this, but that that's um, not like a wage boost. It's the capital investment or it's investment in like real objects. Right. And in that case, that's its real asset to the community, but that's not really quantifiable in terms of a wage increase or kind of the impact metrics that we have here. It's not, that's outside of the scope of what we're asking for. But I think if that was a project that came in the door, that would be exciting for us to look at. Yeah, I think I have some thoughts on that. I mean, if we're just focused on increasing the wages, I feel pretty concerned about just including any business participating in tourism. Because essentially it's just like, I don't know, maintaining the ability of these businesses to operate with low wages. I don't know, it is boosting the quality of life of workers, but it's also like, it's not really like solving a, pro a problem in the structure of the business, I guess. I'm not saying that right. very well, but it's kind of just subsidizing their, their low wages so that they can stay competitive. So I'm not sure how you would discern which businesses are deserving of that and which aren't. Well, let me, let me pull up this. This is, I think, probably a good point to look at this. Can you all see the spreadsheet that I just pulled up? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, so Ben prepared this. Um, this is some data on from the Department of Workforce Services on particular industries. Um, let's start here. Particular industries, how many there are in our community, how many they employ, what are the average wages, and um, what kind of is a multiplier for um, economic research that says if you increase a um, hundred direct jobs or a million dollars in demand within that industry, how many indirect jobs are created, kind of a, trying to suss out a multiplier effect. Um, so at, at some level, that's, that's a way to start to guide this conversation about desirable industries. Is, uh, would you zoom in just a tiny bit on that? I think it's a little oh, small. Oh yeah, sure. Is it looking really far away right now? Let's see how I can do that. Is that better? Mm -hmm. I think that has all of that. I mean, so would it be possible? Uh, I, I forget exactly how you phrased the grant criteria before, but one one thing you could do is we're, we're interested in creating higher pay or paying jobs or more diversity or, you know, preferably both. But, you know, I, I think more diversity and higher paying are, are not exactly the same thing, but they both seem desirable for the community. Right. So, you know, if we, if we, if we, we can search here for, um, 
average monthly wage, for example, we can we can sort top to bottom. This is showing us, you know, in the mining industry, it's the highest wage. Utilities are the second. Um, healthcare and social assistance are the third. Um, but you also see that um, for these two, not small number of employment, small number of establishments. Healthcare and social assistance, we have a huge number. You know, obviously with the hospital, um, public administration, that's us. And then there's this professional scientific, professional scientific and technical services, um, which I would assume is, you know, any kinds of those kind of consulting type technical jobs. But, you know, I guess I'm bringing this up because these are things we can quantitatively filter by, you know, we can upfront saying, well, these, you know, if we go down here, these, these industries, arts, entertainment, recreation, accommodation, food services, retail trade, real estate, rental and leasing, educational services, they just pay too low. And um, for reference, 3,244 is our average monthly wage countywide across all industries. So, you know, if your industry pays below, then you don't, you know, get to apply or something like that. Those are the kinds of things we could do or use as a weighting mechanism to think about that um, as you can see, you know, basically these are, these are our tourism industries, Wait, the retail trade, accommodation, food services. Um, and then this has kind of the outdoor, the outfitters are in arts, entertainment and recreation. Um, these, these are just information to help us think about what are, what is the kind of, how do we define desirable industries? Um, you know, if we filter by um, total indirect jobs created by a certain amount of demand, super high up there is actually looks like real estate creates a lot of jobs and entertainment and recreation creates a lot of jobs. So I wonder you know, maybe it would make sense not to sort of officially list targeted industries, but you know, this could be something that's discussed on the panel that's awarding the grants, but I, 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 I don't know if it makes sense to tie our hands quite so explicitly at the very beginning, you know, just ha having some wiggle room, especially, you know, in case something unexpected comes along might be desirable. Yeah. And then after the first year, if it looks like the grants are going in directions that the county doesn't like, you know, we could, we could make some things more explicit. Uh, con conversely to creating a sort of a, a larger list of eligible businesses, there could be a, you know, there could be one or two or three that are just kind of, you know, kind of flat out excluded in this round because the, the idea would be that the, you know, it's, um, it would almost surely not be aligned with the, the goals and the vision of, of the program. Say for example, uh, rentals and tours and hospitality or something for, for, as an example, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I, I was, yeah, so, so certainly I think just listing the industries that are targeted, I, I don't like that idea. I think I also, even though, I mean, I don't, I don't think we should grant these things willy nilly, um, you know, there could be some kind of, you know, very tourism based thing, but the it's doing it in an innovative way that creates really high paying jobs. And that's, some, I mean, that's, that's not diversification, but it is high paying jobs. And it's, something that, you know, helps us to, you know, have a healthy tourist economy without maybe so many people here. Um, I wouldn't want to rule those out just from the very beginning if someone comes along with a proposal that, and we're not committing to do that. So, so I guess I'm hoping that the, the grant committee will, you know, use good judgment, but I'm, I'm a little leery of thinking that before we get any applications, we can come up with these concrete criteria for what we want to fund and what we don't. It does seem to me that they should be weighted. Like I think diversification should have a greater weight than just increasing the wage because it has a, a longer lasting impact, hopefully, you know. And it's the yeah. goal of the entire could, program. Yeah. And I think that just really gets into the question is, 
if we're having you know diversification as a as a you know, five point element of a 40 point rubric or something 20 point rubric um 25. and i'm coming this is it 25 point yeah right uh and i and i and i'm and i'm an impartial person from the state for example and you know i'm seeing a uh, seeing an application come in um what 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 am i what is guiding my interpretation of what diversification is You know, are we looking at, we could look at percentage of industry, percentage of payroll within the, the larger county. If you're under, you know, we can, we can look, something we've talked about is looking at this data and saying, okay, basically making the payroll number as a percentage of the overall number and saying that if your payroll is, if, the, if your industry is, is, payroll percentage of your industry is below a certain percent, a certain threshold, then that's a, a minority industry or one that we know currently don't have a, 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 a foothold in and therefore is a priority for diversification. Um, from trying to come up with a quantitative way to, to think about this, if not, we need to really make a qualitative description of what diversification is to guide you know, our scores. I think I, I think the problem with that is some some industries are inherently a small percentage. Like you know, we can only support so many dentists in the town. So someone comes and says, you know, only a tiny percentage of our payroll is dentists. You know, that I guess that wouldn't impress me because we probably have I don't I don't know. But I mean, you know, there are there there are jobs that are just rare by design, and then other things like you know, trail and retail, which is a huge you know, potentially a huge diverse category and th there can be diversity within you know these tourism things so i mean something that we could do is throughout this process is basically draft a statement that is measured against right which is this is this is what we're trying to these are the outcomes that we're looking for the goals in what kind of a diversified economy looks like and have a know a qualitative question a long long you know paragraph type question that we ask the, the participants how does this contribute to the diversification of you know grand county's economy based off of increasing its resiliency um to shocks and vag vag vagaries in the tourism visitation to our area um you know what and and how else you would you know define maybe sustainability that is allowing us to be resilient to changes to climate um you know those are the things that we can kind of say here's what we're looking for in diversification how do you meet this kind of statement um and measure those two against each other at the end of the day um that's the only thing that i can think of that isn't kind of this quantitative uh, bright line. I, I think I, I'm generally in support of that kind of approach. I think it would uh, allow the applicants to use their expertise of the of their market and the market of the county, um, you know, to make their case to make that case. Um, and and as as has been stated before in this discussion, it it would sort of a, a, allow some leeway at least for this first first year. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, see kind of sort of seeing what what comes out and what 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 sort of applications come in. Um, and then it can be, you know, adjusted if the results aren't exactly, um, you know, what the county and the commission sort of um, are, are imagining. Um, that, that generally feels feels like a fair way of going about it, even though it, it does, you know, it does leave some it does leave plenty of subjective interpretation by the by the panel, um, but I, you know, it's. I think it's pretty clear as well. I, I think one thing, and I'll I'll let any other people speak to this, but one thing that I think helps is that by having a, a group of five people that have different backgrounds, you know, scoring everything, you kind of average out outlying opinions, and and ideally, kind of find um, that wisdom of the masses. You know, it's a small mass, but five people um, and kind of taking that qualitative and putting it through their brain and having a quantitative outcome on the other side and averaging that across five other people's judgments 
I think if we're providing pretty clear, um, you know, goal statements that I think you can get a pretty good assessment of, well, this one's better than that one based off of what we're reading. Um, and, you know, it is an experiment, you know, this is a pilot, um, although it is a lot of money, but I think that, that, um, based off of the kind of exercises we've done to, to, to figure out priorities based off of the boards, we've been doing these kinds of, you know, small group averaging out exercises, and it's actually proven to be fairly effective. Um, so I, I, I'd be favorable of kind of trying to do that type of model for the diversification side, maybe keeping that with the wages. So you're getting this combination of wage and diversification goals as the outcome of any application. Um, yeah. And rant, any, any other thoughts? Um, I, I had a question that I probably should have asked much, much earlier, but so is this being funded entirely from the diversification budget within TRT revenue? Uh, that, that's how it is structured at the moment, yeah. Okay, and, and so the, you, meant, you quoted some lines from a, some ordinance that has established one of these boards, um, but the, I mean, the, the important goals are just the criteria for spending that money, right? That, like, we, we won't get in trouble if we, um, like, yeah, the, the statement, that goal statement right there, that, that's from, like, a county ordinance that's unrelated to our funding source, right? Yeah, the, the, that goal statement is what we drafted to try to capture the spirit of this program. Okay, um, I, I thought I saw a similar line in, in that county ordinance that established one of the boards you mentioned? This, this, is, the, this is the ordinance. So we, we okay. obviously drew on this ordinance to inspire that goal statement, but okay. the goal statement is not a direct quote of the ordinance um, necessarily. Okay. I'm just saying, so, so the, the, the goal statement, I mean, if we, want, we can tinker with the goal statement as long as we're yeah. staying consistent with the, the strings that are attached to our funding source. That's, that's correct. And these are the strings. I mean, they are very vague at the state level. You know, if any economic act development activity that is reasonably similar to supplements or expands, and reasonably similar to, I'm not a lawyer, but reasonably similar to seems to be a fairly flexible, you know, legal um, guardrail. Um, and, you know, something that I've been thinking about is that Okay, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity gave us $300,000 to help fund affordable housing in Arroyo Crossing this year. That's an economic development program from the state. If that's the rules that we're using, then that then should we be able to just use the TRT line item to also support housing in that kind of direct fashion? Um, and really, so long as we find some elements of the state programming that align with what we want to do, we can do something that's reasonably similar to that. I mean, um, maybe. I would favor Sorry, a simple program like that, that that creates more affordable housing for the workforce versus just, I don't know, it's just more directly for the, the worker, maybe. It's not exactly. I don't know. There's something about that that seems like um, that I like it better than just doing a wage pass through for businesses without right. a I mean, diversification requirement. And I mean that. I mean that's a really good question. Basically, for context, I wanted to bring up how you know how the rest of that million dollars is currently budgeted because um, this is the biggest amount. So out of about a million for diversification, um, we have half a million dedicated to this program. We've kind of uh, selected about $100,000, which I don't think we'll spend the full amount, but I want to consider that basically spent supporting the Small Business Development Center at USU Moab. About 65 grand for a master plan. And then that leaves um, $100,000 for a workforce development program and $50,000 for, I think it's a little too high, but it's a, for now, that basically marketing and engagement for all of the above, you know, creating community events and putting ads in the paper to advertise all these programs. 
So, you know, something to consider is that, you know, that $500,000 amount is, you know, it's been approved and budgeted and all that, but it can be moved around. If we're thinking that um, housing, workforce housing is a big priority, do we create, you know, and do we either change the impact of this program to basically be rather than a wage thing, which would allow people to ideally afford the housing options that are out there, is this targeted and making it more, you know, this is a workforce housing program that goes through the private sector, right? That goes through any any business or nonprofit that is is figure is already figuring out a way to to house their people, and we're helping them out with that. You know, that benefits all and it's very focused on what we're trying to, I think, the needs of the community. Um, and, you know, we could rewrite the impact section of this to make it focused on that. Um, or we could take this, split it in half, and, or do an either or, saying you could apply, you know, based on this workforce development or this workforce housing development angle or this wage angle. You know, really, I do, I, I think that, I, I think where you're thinking is right on the money, which is, how are we making this really useful for our needs of the community at the moment? I guess it seems like we've got other funding sources that are specifically about housing, like you know, all the things that are being used at Arroyo Crossing. And I just think, you know, this budget, if you're asking, you know, how many new houses could it build? It's a, kind of a small number compared to the overall numbers that are getting bent. So I, I guess I'm less, I mean, certainly housing is a serious issue here, but we have other tools to address that. And we, I would be more inclined to spend this on things that are more focused on diversification. August, have you got, have you all talked about, like, there's a very slim array of commercial properties that are appropriate or that for new burgeoning small scale manufacturing or like the amount of, input that it usually requires people to remodel spaces, things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that an aspect of this grant that you're envisioning? Basically <clears throat> facilitating like more and diverse commercial spaces um, that are affordable. Um, I would say that that would be a very useful way to spend this money, but as, as we're planning it, it's kind of, that would be on the, that would be on the applicant. So, you know, if the applicant has a, a parcel in mind or a storefront that they're going to turn into two, you know, uh, subdivide their storefront um, with, a, with the grant, I think this would be useful for it. In terms of like a bigger kind of multi-stakeholder private-public partnership to develop better, cheaper, more diverse commercial space, um, I think that would, that it would be good to spend the money. The, I think this budget would be a useful place to pull that money from as well as the rural county grant to do something like that but i don't think it's currently designed to take on a big development project like that um, it's more what as a community are people already thinking of that we can kind of leverage ideas and existing capital and other grants to push those ideas over the edge but i'm certainly thinking yeah i think that would be a great application is you know basically an increase in usable commercial space. Even helping people build like workshops at their home, et cetera. I know a few people who are running like little cottage industries out of their house and, and uh, they could definitely benefit from something like this. Totally. So, I mean, I think in that case, you know, if you're a cottage industry, single employee person, Based on the impacts that we have here, you know, if you know, if this money was used to basically bump out your workspace and add some more space to it, we would be asking them to provide basically themselves more money um, via payroll. We haven't really defined like a revenue or a profit expansion impact um, that would be more business oriented. You know, if I'm an entrepreneur maybe it matters more to me to just grow my business in terms of revenue and profit versus paying myself more at this point in time. Or, or, even, paying, clarified or, or, or even paying like a, an, 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 you know, if someone wants to grow their business a little bit, hiring an extra employee, for example, would, would be great. 
yeah so we do have capture that for sure you know if you if that created a new job that was you know within that wage bracket I think that's a great, great metric. One thought I had with, um, you were talking about like the purchasing of machinery or whatever. I mean, that can often lead to the like decrease in an actual job. Or, or an increase. <laughs> It, it could lead to an increase in the job too. You need you need people to operate some of that machinery. I, I know someone recently who just purchased a couple of machines to help build a sewing business and they're looking for help to uh, just expand a little bit. Yeah. Well, and we can define it, you know, don't buy a robot that eliminates human labor, please. But, you know, something that allows you to produce more. To produce and, more. You know, add the yeah, add the Luddite clause that is, it has to, you know, require human labor. So I'm wondering, since it's four o'clock is getting closer and there's the other grant program to discuss, maybe, maybe August, you could just try to synthesize some of the ideas and come back with version two to be reviewed yeah. and some other. So that sounds good. My main, my main outcomes at this point, let me make sure I have everything for this kind of section is, you know, for the scoring committee, making that a city representative specifically, um, uh, maybe for the metrics section, adding, you know, a revenue or a profit metric for businesses or organizations or services provided. I think that's actually in here. Um, and, or for with that kind of YGP commercial kitchen element, you know, providing resources will the project result in resources that can help further diversify our community, um, you know, rather than creating wages or revenues, it's creating a community asset. Um, and then really defining diversification, I think we're going to, we'll try to draft kind of a goal or definition of what diversification looks like and make sure that there's a question that basically asks participants or applicants to um, measure, describe how their project would, would match that or reach that goal. And um, I think that's the main things here. Um, I'm glad you didn't have any details with the match percentage or any other um, smaller stuff. We feel pretty good about that. But of course, if you have input on those things, let us know. Um, the other things on here, let me just look at this. One thing I wanted to mention that's relevant for both grants is you know, we want these both to be local. And what we've been thinking about is defining local ownership in terms of like percentage ownership in the company and making making that be, you know, Grand County residents um, be the majority share or 50% ownership in a business, something like that. And then, you know, thinking of really the economic community we have here, if you live in San Juan, Spanish, or Spanish excuse me, San Juan, Spanish Valley, and you live there, but you own a business on Main Street, you know, I would think that you should be eligible for this program. And can we come up with a way to define that as such? Um, and so thinking of ownership and then, you know, percentage of, of business operated within, maybe they run a business where they're all over the place, but most of their stuff happens around here. That's, that's something I wanted to flag as well. Um, but I think, I think I feel pretty good about this for now. Um, there will be many layers of review and we'll come back to this one. Um, let's talk about this. Are there any questions on that before we kind of go over this last grant program for the day? Do we do any last comments on the diversification stuff? I'm going to move on. So, um, let's just dive right into this. So I think really the intention here is that, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, a local you know, tourism oriented business and I'm seeing this diversification program, I'm like, I'm not going to qualify for that. Is my, you know, community, is my kind of local organizations really supporting, you know, our, our smaller local businesses, you know, yes, I'm in tourism, but it's, it's my family. It's how we survive. Can we provide something that kind of fits what the county wants to do, 
um, to those businesses to provide something to all applicants, regardless of what they're up to. So this really is, is grounded in, in um, I think, the tourism promotion budget restriction. So thinking the easiest way to do that is kind of a marketing grant, very similar to the event grant program that we've done in the past. Um, so starting there, that's the idea, to support small locally owned tourism businesses um, by, via providing um, or supplementing a marketing budget. And, and so in particular, this will be funded out of the, the promotion part of the budget? That's how it's currently designed, yep. Okay. So obviously, that's I think another question down the line is how, how are we interpreting how that money can be spent and therefore can this be spent on more than just advertising? But for the strictest interpretation, starting at advertising is the place that would make you know, the easiest sense. So the idea that you know, smaller businesses can have access to marketing budget, partner with our local advertisers, come up with an interesting plan and um, you know, grow, grow, grow some element of their business. Um, thinking questions for the county would, would be, would this have to be compliant with the Grand County Ad Ordinance that governs our ad spend? Um, at the moment, um, I'm pretty sure that the event advertisements, you know, if, if you're the Folk Fest and you're receiving event grants from us and you're advertising in Telluride to say, hey, come visit the Folk Fest, um, you know, that's a pretty explicit ask um, for visitation. And, and, you know, is that something that we want to ask recipients of this grant to be in line with as well or, or not? Um, again, businesses and nonprofit organizations and limiting this to basically organizations that have um, no more than 10 full-time equivalent employees. We looked at kind of the, the state data and kind of what kind of businesses that, that looks like. It, it, it makes eligible about two thirds of our businesses. And from just a quick scan of what was on there, felt like appropriate sized businesses for what, we're, what small local looks like. And I'd be happy to share that with everybody to kind of scan on their own time if they'd like. Let me know. This is obviously we've been gestating this for much less time than the diversification grants. And when it came to really what's what are we trying to measure and therefore induce impact, came a little fuzzy. You know, are we going to say if you have like the best marketing plan based off of a return on investment in terms of you're going to spend a thousand bucks and it's going to come back as a you know two thousand dollars in revenue? Um, or um, thinking about things like um, our responsible recreation programming, you know, is this more of a program that is expanding that to the community and saying, hey, we're trying to prioritize, you know, a more sustainable and responsible vision of tourism visitation in our economy, come up with, with a marketing plan that, um, or a branding that takes that into account and if you aren't already doing that as a business, here's an opportunity for you to do that and work with our other community stakeholders. You know, maybe it's a, you know, come to our business, we'll give you a free water bottle and, um, you know, you know, no more plastic water bottles or I don't know, something like that um, is how, when I started thinking more about this, that we could start to kind of create a wedge out of this rather than just, you know, if I'm, if I'm scoring this, and you're coming to me with, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I would like $5,000 for Facebook ads because it's going to give me $10,000 in new revenue. That's awesome. But is that, how do I measure that against every other business that has the exact same plan? Right. Um, the other thing to think about on this um, was, you know, is it aligned with our mission and vision as an office, which I wanted to share with you because this is just kind of, this is just what's on our website um, right now. Oh, not there. Nope, not there either. Um, so this is what's on the Travel Council part of the Grand County website. Um, you know, I don't know where this comes from necessarily. This would probably be revisited in, in the planning process, but um, I'm assuming this is language that Elaine drafted and it's on the website because that's how, that's what, the, the lower economic development statement is, but, you know, it is the travel council's responsibility to promote and encourage local tourism to help broaden and strengthen the county's economic base 
Travel Council seeks to accomplish this through promoting, promotion, promotion, supporting recreation, tourism, and conventions in a manner that protects the beauty and scenery of our national environment. The objective is not to increase the number of visitors coming to Moab, but to reach out to markets of higher end demographics to attract fewer but higher spending visitors. We also strive to change perceived weaknesses and strength and increase the revenue received. So, you know, in general, and if that's if that's something that we're asking people to ask to kind of focus on, does this feel aligned with the, you know, what our office should be focusing on? And and maybe I'm opening a can of worms by bringing this up, but you know, as we're doing a planning process, it would be to revisit these kinds of things and make sure it's in line with what we all want to be prioritizing. For what our office, this is some, the statement that I put together that's kind of more general is, you know, that our office collaborates with private, public, and community stakeholders to support a robust, resilient, sustainable, and inclusive economy. Um, way more broad, but you know, if we were to do that kind of like aligned with our mission vision as an org, this is what you know is out there today. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. Any kind of general thoughts on this in terms of how mm -hmm. we can start? What would be an appropriate angle for this type of program? Well, so one distinction that you haven't mentioned yet is, you know, we there can be marketing the same for people that are already here, like you know, the like eat at this restaurant now that you're in Moab, or come shop at this expensive gift shop, but it it doesn't really increase visitation. It just does a better job of you know, deriving economic benefit from the visitors who are already here. So that that right, seems like getting a slice of the pie. Yeah, so that that seems like an important distinction to me, and and I think. Funding that kind of thing seems unproblematic. Um, you, you also mentioned in some cases something that is designed to draw visitors here, but in a more sustainable way, and maybe that fits as well. But I, but I think you know another example you mentioned, like hey, come to the folk festival. That doesn't seem so appropriate to me. I mean, I I do think we've got a lot of visitors, and we should really be focusing on getting more out of the visitors we have rather than increasing numbers. So I I, I would just maybe. One simple thing we could do is in this program, this anything that is designed to draw more people to Moab is off limits, and it's all about getting them to decide to do things once they're already here. Sure, I second that. Yeah, and I and I also really like the sustainability message aspect of it too. I think I think you can use those two in conjunction and and talk about sustainability and how your I don't know business might um, help manage that. Too. Cool. Yeah, another thing I'm realizing as I'm talking about this is, um, you know, also this can be uh, a lever to help um, bring that kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion elements to our local tourism industry. You know, you know, helping to support those who maybe aren't usually able to take advantage of the the dollars flowing through the tourism economy. Um, if there's a burgeoning guide who is um, you know, not of the traditional background, um, that would be a great thing to support, I would think. So those kinds of things, might, that might be another layer to add. One thing I was going to say is in the sustainability messaging, I think that's really great. And using our leverage here, like we're offering free money uh, to try to get more of that is awesome. And I would like to add one thing to that list, which is talking about good stewardship, which I think is different from all of those because the rest of them are kind of like, not punitive, but a little bit like, don't do this and don't do this, as opposed to encouraging this, like we are stewards of this land. We are here yeah. to help with that in whatever way. I, I like that. I also any, agree. Any other... I'm in concurrence with um, what Kevin was talking about, the difference between advertising outside of town, trying to bring in new people versus within Moab, trying to gain more revenue from them. Yeah. And the other element there is that then you get a multiplier effect because if you're advertising locally, you're also supporting local advertisers. So that's, in, you know, indirectly supporting radio you know, the radio stations and the newspapers and, you know, King Lamp advertising, et cetera. Um, I mean, you could also do targeted paid social locally 
on geofence it to 84532. But, um, you know, I think that at that collaboration metric there, does the project engage local organizations and advertisers as partners? It's um, doubly good for our, our local business community in that way. Mm -hmm. um, while we're kind of thinking about this, there's a couple other things I was, was going to, I realized I, I skipped for this. Um, these are the kinds of kind of program specific questions we'd be asking. You know, what, what are you hoping to promote? What would be your goals with this campaign? Who is your target market? Um, so in this case, if we're restricting it to local, you know, within our market, is there a particular type of recreationist or person that you're looking to attract? Timeline, um, you know, how would this involve the community? Uh, so $55,000 uh, budgeted. So thinking about 11 $5,000 awards would be one way to do it. It could also be 22. $2,500 awards. That same one year time around, turnaround, that 90 10 split, um, a 10% matching requirement with the same rules. Um, and let me just see if there's anything else on here. Yeah. So, the, so again, a, I think we've. Could you give a quick rundown on our ad ordinance? Is that ATV specific? Sorry, I'm not remembering. The ad ordinance is the one that basically says um, for for our office, if we're play, if I'm placing an ad somewhere, um, it has to either be education or responsible recreation oriented, right? So not not just um, you know come visit Moab, but come visit Moab re responsibly. Um, or I think timed entry is a good example of educational marketing, where we're just like, hey, this is happening in our area, and you need to know about it. Yeah. So uh, maybe this is the elephant in the room, but I would also not like to see this money going towards more ATV, UTV tours that are operating locally. And I'm not sure what the rest of the commission thinks about that, but it, it does seem like an easy, it would be fueling a fire that our constituents are very um, encouraged about. Yeah, so maybe that falls under some sustainability broadly can construed i mean I, I think there are there are impacts not just to the land but in town and no, noise is one of them so yeah I, I would think more generally any any kind of activity that tends to affect residents quality of life and you know atv yeah. tours is one of those um and and i think on the same token it could be used as an opportunity or kind of like an offering to those who do have do do those kind of OHV tours and saying, you know, if you can come up with a way to offer a more sustainable package um, or do different types of messaging alongside your tours um, in some way, this is an opportunity to to do that. I don't I don't know exactly what that would look like, but you know, kind of. Anyway, just wanted to flag that. I, I didn't think about it too much. So but maybe, no, so maybe somewhere in this list of criteria, maybe just put in explicitly, um, you know, sort of quality of life issues for residents, because I, I, I think Sarah makes a good point. You know, we've already said that we don't want to draw even more people here because we feel like there's already enough. But the people who come here, some have more impact than others, you know, both in the back country and in town. And I, I think we should just explicitly say that we're trying to promote tourism that is sustainable in the sense that you know people can put up with it you know living living nearby it sure i i think uh something i want to flag or, or i guess before we're always still here any other comments on this just just one comment it's 341 and i'd love to wrap this up by 345 if at all possible so we have a little break before four o'clock um so i don't want to kill your mojo but just want to call that out looks like we can get there i think we can I'll just say one thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll take any final comments. I think the other thing that is important and, and, and a part of this, and I didn't flag this in the earlier kind of like department wide operation update is that, um, you know, there's been conversation about either revising the ad ordinance or coming up with a better way to, you know, have transparency between our office and the commission in terms of what we're actually placing, what materials we're creating and making sure that it does comply with the ad ordinance. Um, as well as I think when you look at 
this mission statement that's on our website, you know, our our office would love, you know, as we're coming up with new programs, having a good good guidance on, you know, really what should we be focusing on? Should we be with that kind of state red emerald um, strategy that's prioritizing quote unquote quality visitation rather than um, quantity visitation? And what does that look like for our area? And for me, I think a lot of that's going to come out of a planning process through a master plan. Um, but I just wanted to flag that, that, you know, when we're thinking about this stuff, like the fly-in visitation campaign, you know, based on this, that, that certainly fits, but is this really, is this what the commission wants us to be doing with the out of market advertising that we are doing? Um, because I do think that there's a certain amount of responsibility for me in terms of, um, trying to ensure that we're maintaining a reasonable, sustainable tourism economy. Um, and I think some amount of out of market advertising focused on kind of pro really optimizing the ratio between economic impact and environmental slash community kind of impact is the way to go and trying to suss that out in the longer term with this, with this, with the commission and getting direction to our office is going to be a useful exercise for me at some point. Does this state, I guess, does this statement feel appropriate? Is this off anywhere? I mean, I think it could use a little reworking and it'd be nice to say something about the sustainable messaging, like our goal to encourage good stewardship in this mission statement, I think. I, I think there's like an empty sentence. We strive to change perceived weakness into strengths. Yeah, I only just realized that this is on our website, so I actually hadn't seen this in a while, um, but mainly if people go to the travel council part of our website, this is this is what they see and just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I, I think it's maybe trying to rework this though. I, though I think it probably is, has been evolving in the right direction compared to what was there a few years ago. So but cool. I think we can do even better, so. Well, uh, 344 Gabe, so, you know, I'll get at, I'll give you an extra minute for your break unless there are any final comments, questions Again, the, the timeline for process is that we're going to bring this um, to our boards, to the public, and then back to the commission um, and kind of continue to refine it over time. But, you know, this conversation has been enlightening and, and very useful in a lot of ways. And I appreciate your kind attention and patience for the last hour and 45 and give you 15 before you got another like six hours or whatever, maybe not six, four of whatever you got to do for the rest of the day. Well, uh, you know, if you if you're indicating that it was very enlightening and helpful, that's uh, that's really positive, and I'm really glad to hear that. And um, just be in touch. Um, you know, we'll be in touch about how we can further assist you. And um, yeah, hope this gives you some some ammunition. Thank Thanks, you. I appreciate all of you. Thank you, August. All right, we, we will uh, reconvene at 4 p.m. So you can leave the, ch leave the chat or stay on mute. Thanks everyone.
Just gonna give this a couple more minutes here. Hey, somebody give me a sound check. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. All right, it is 4.02, and I will go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Grand County Commission, a regular meeting on Tuesday, March 1st, 2022. Uh, present are Grand County Commissioners Hadler, McGann, Walker, Stock, Hedin, and uh, myself, Commissioner Wojtek, the chair, uh, currently don't have Commissioner Clapper present. Hopefully he'll join us soon. Uh, also present are Commission Administrator Mallory Nassau, Clerk Auditor uh, Quinn Hall, and Planning and Zoning Director John Gunther. And I'll leave it there as to introductions. <clears throat> uh, we'll start off this meeting with our first Citizens to be Heard section. If there are any members of the public that would like to make public comment at this time, you are welcome to do so. Okay, seeing none at this time, we'll move on. I will note that we do have another citizens to be heard section that we will uh, hope to open up at 6 p.m. or at the end of whichever action item we might be on at that moment. So um, please bear with us um, for the 6 p.m. Uh, citizens to be heard if you wish to speak then. I was partly trying to stall a little bit too because we have a, we're, we're ready to move on to our first item which is item A, a presentation and update from Southeastern Utah Health Department on COVID-19 in Grand County. And I was kind of hoping to see Brady Bradford on the roll. Maybe he's in the chambers there. <laughs> your, your audio is um, not intelligible. Okay, so I, I didn't really hear you at all, but maybe I'm guessing that you were offering to put the, the our second presentation first. <laughs> okay, oh, that, that's fine with me. I still don't see um, Braden Bradford on the call here. Um, so do what you need to do to get the audio ready so we can actually hear y'all in the chambers there. All right. Let's see, there might be some double noise on our end at least. So oh. we need to kill one of them. How's that? Can you guys hear us? Can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah the echo good. just went away. It's good. How about now? It was really good just a second ago, and then now you're echoing again. No. So turn that volume back down. How is it now? Sounds good. Sounds good. I just need to turn it up on this one. 
for her dull moment. Okay, how is it now? I think you sound good. good. All right. All right. So. Could you zoom into the document? Do that for you. <laughs> Actually, it's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You should be good to go when you're ready. So let me know when you want me to start. Please go right ahead. Thank you. All right. So I guess I'm a long ways away from the camera. I'm Bill Holly. Maybe I'll turn a little bit this way. You can see me a little better. Um, I, uh, I sit on the airport board and uh, one of my uh, pet projects for several years now uh, and others has been to discuss uh, getting a Canyonlands field uh, powered by solar energy. So uh, the goals of that uh, idea, if everybody can see this document, uh, was to use solar power to provide 100% of Canyonlands Fields uh, operations. Now that includes the terminal, uh, the fire station, the runway lights, and really anything that the uh, county pays for out there. Uh, th that goal was is the green goal. The idea being that that uh, we would move forward with that. Now, uh, solar power is not uh, necessarily in the way that it's done with uh, metering is not necessarily 100% of the cost. Uh, in fact, it, it, it never is. So there's really two issues. The issue of supplying green power is one really important thing. The other goal is to reduce the cost to the airport. Now the cost reduction is, is made through self-generation of power, but through uh, Rocky Mountain Power and their rate structure, it uh, really, you can't really get 100% of your money back, but you can get a lot of it back. So based on, uh, on, on how much power you generate and uh, what your rate structure is, you can get a great deal of the power back. Also solar power uh, is good for reducing demand. If, if any of you know what demand power is, that's the, uh, when, whenever you have a higher demand during the day, uh, Rocky Mountain Power in commercial and things like the terminal uh, charge you a lot more for power. And so uh, power at, uh, the, uh, at the airport is largely used during the day. And so solar is really a good way to uh, uh, reduce this demand. Demand power is, is significantly more expensive than other power. The other thing uh, for cost reduction is just inflation proofing the cost of power. If you're self-generating power, uh, then, then in some ways you've uh, walked away from uh, part of the cost of uh, what Rocky Mountain Power is gonna charge you. Other goals to develop and use a financing model that uh, works well for the county. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna spend most of this presentation talking about those different financing uh, ideas. And then a side issue is explore options for uh, uh, electrical vehicles and charging stations. Any questions so far? All right. So, so there's way too much detail in this scope, but I wanted to, to try to address the audience. I know some of you are really uh, pretty skilled in, in solar stuff and, and others, this is uh, uh, new to you. But the, out at the airport, we use, uh, we spend, we use about 21,000 kilowatts uh, a month, kilowatt hours per month. 
and that cost to us is it's and the budgeted cost is about twenty two hundred dollars a month for all of the county operations at the airport. So uh, again, that comes out to twenty five or twenty six thousand a year for uh, just the power usage at the airport. Uh, just so you know, the the terminal and the other things out there are all electric. There is no gas left out there, propane or natural gas. All right, so when you're gonna buy a, a, a solar system, what you wanna do is, is uh, make 100% of your power. Uh, and, and, and that has to do with the Rocky Mountain Power's uh, rate structure. Because what you're doing basically is, is you're, you're, uh, you're making your own power, but at night, you're banking that power with Rocky Mountain. That means during the day, your excess power goes to Rocky Mountain, and then at night, uh, or during a cloudy day, they send that in. They they uh, sell that power back to you uh, at full price. The power you send them that is surplus, uh, they only give you five eighths of a cent on the dollar uh, on it. So so they make. Uh, so when you're sizing a system. You basically look at your daytime usage and your nighttime usage plus the, the loss that you take uh, by Rocky Mountain Power, uh, plus some uh, fluff for uh, non-solar days where you don't generate much energy. A little bit about uh, Moab. Moab is, is one of the areas in the United States that's uh, nearly the best uh, solar climate. Uh, Western Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and a little part of Utah is, are some of the best places to generate uh, solar energy in the United States. And we're in it. So the proposed system would be about uh, 650 kilowatt hours uh, for as, as far as sizing the system. And it would be placed on the ground out there. Uh, it'll, it would take up about 0.3 to 0.4 acres. It would be on a net metering system with the uh, power company and the lifespan of the system is 25 to 30 years. Now that said, that means that, that uh, 25 to 30 years, the system is still generating about 85% of its rated power. So, so really that, that's a kind of a arbitrary number because once you put one of these things up, you can replace cells and equipment uh, on a as needed basis for a long, long time. Uh, questions? I'll just keep going. Somebody raise your hand if they have a question. I do have one question. Yeah. Um, so I know I have net metering at my house in town and Rocky Mountain Power still charges a connection fee for the grid, all that. What yeah. is, how substantial is that for the, the airport? Uh, it, it turns out that the, uh, that, that there are two kinds of charges on your power bill or two classes, if you will. One of them is, is as you mentioned, this, the fixed charges. And that's just the, there's a fixed charge that they charge everybody per month, uh, regardless of how much power you use. Uh, and, and that's kind of a moving picture, but, but and the other part of course is the actual power you use. And so uh, for the airport, it's charged just like your house per meter. Right now, the, the county has three meters out there. So yes, there is that. That's why I say that, that uh, the self-generation of power will never pay 100% of your power bill because there are those fixed charges. And, and of course there are, uh, again, the way they, the rate stra the net metering works, you know that, that they don't pay you uh, as much as, you, as they charge you for, the, for that power which is fairly common. Rocky you know Mountain Power is a, little, is a little more oppressive than, than most states. Do you know how much those charges are? I know for my bill, it's only like $9 a month. Yeah, it's, it's pretty small. Uh, okay. it's, it's the same kind of thing as that, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so then the, everybody says, well, how much is this gonna cost? Well, that's, we'll get into that with the financing options. But, but largely what it, what it means is, is that 
uh, the price is many and varied based on what you, what method you use to finance it. Uh, and, and of course, uh, whatever the bid prices are of, uh, uh, you know, from the various vendors when you do an RFP. So that's why the price break is really, a price range is really large because uh, at the bottom end would be where you just bought the system and the top end would be where you go into some kind of uh, financing uh, to uh, buy the system. We do the next page, how do we do the next page? All right, let's talk about financing options. Uh, probably the best way to do it uh, is to buy the system outright. And the reason of that's pretty obvious. Uh, you, you know, if you if you've got the money to buy it, uh, then then you get all the benefits of of not paying interest or uh, getting a loan or or some other way to to uh, get that system. Also, any credits that uh, you know may be available, uh, you know you can you can use. Um, also, the also this that this kind of a thing buying outright actually immediately as soon as the system comes online uh you know lowers the power bill at the uh you know at the airport now the disadvantages um that means you've got to find, go find money uh just like uh, any project you'd have to budget for it if you were going to find it out of co county coffers or uh grants bank loans uh that kind of stuff would have to be arranged now, unfortunately, uh, uh, nonprofit entities and entities like the county uh, are considered nonprofit. Nonprofit don't, don't pay any taxes. And so they don't qualify in the current world for uh, the federal and tax and state rebates that you and your home would get if you were just buying this for your house. So that, that raises the price of the system because you don't get those rebates. So these rebates can account for up to 35% of the original purchase cost. Now, something really interesting is happening, though. Um, the uh, climate bill that is currently on the floor in Congress, uh, call, the, it's the old Build Back Better bill, uh, really uh, eliminates that and allows uh, nonprofit entities, such as the county, to get the federal rebate uh, for uh, this. Now, who knows if this is going to pass or even if it will pass. It's, uh, it's, it's sitting there and the current form of it, I'm told, has the, this uh, rebate for nonprofits in it. So, so I guess we'll have to see if that happens. I couldn't tell you a bit about the timing for that. Another disadvantage would be uh, the county uh, would, would have this would own the system immediately uh, and that means if there's any non-maintenance warranty the county would have to have it uh, now typically the equipment in these uh, solar installations like this have a very long warranties of 25 to 30 years i.e the, about the, the length of how long this is good so the actual chances you would pay have to spend a lot of money for maintenance on the system uh, is pretty small Questions on that? All right. Uh, one of the other ways to buy uh, solar things is called a power purchase agreement. Now, typically, this is this kind of agreement is made with a company that 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 actually goes ahead and buys and installs and runs the uh, array. Uh, you basically, your agreement with it from the county would be that you would buy power at a set rate for so many years. Uh, and, there, and these kind of agreements are many and varied. Um, the, these work for the people financing them because they are a private uh, company and they are eligible to take all the rebates. That 35% I was talking about that, that the county couldn't get uh, in the current world uh, someone that's in the private business that built the plant is a private LLC or whatever uh, could get all those rebates. So much of the profit that they get in, in this, other than the money that, that you pay them for the power, 
is the not only the tax rebates, but they can also depreciate the project, which a county I don't believe can do, and and they can also apply interest. So so this kind of a thing uh, costs more, uh, you know, to to us, but it it uh, it is a way for us to essentially get solar, uh, and they would guarantee us that we would pay mo no more per month than we're paying now uh, for, a, for a long period of time for the duration of the contract. And then the duration of these contracts have to be more than six years, but they, and it would, they can, beyond six years, they could be anything. Typically, those the, at the end of that contract period, uh, six to 14 years uh, in the ones I've seen, uh, the county would end would would end up owning uh, the the array, and then it would be it, the the contract would end, and the uh, uh, the company would walk away from it, and at that would, at that point we'd own it and run it just like we would have bought it in the beginning. So um, advantages, uh, you can get into this kind of thing for about the same monthly cost that you're running now. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good thing, but the reality of it is, is that you're going to pay a lot more for it because, you know, you're going to pay this company uh, for this power forever, well, for six to 14 years. Uh, the disadvantages is, is you lose, you, you wouldn't have access to these credits. And of course, this company is in it for the profit. And they would be then be uh, uh, in it to make money and profits and pay their interest costs. And so they would uh, not, not only get all of the credits, but they would also charge you for uh, whatever necessary profits and interests are involved. A little bit more. There's a slight variation of that in the, uh, uh, what's called prepaid power purchase, prepaid power purchase agreements, I'm sorry, three Ps. Uh, and, and this is very similar to the last one, only the difference is, is that you pay a lot more money up front. Uh, you basically uh, uh, pay 80 to 82%, the ones I've seen, and the company pays the remaining, uh, you know, 12% or whatever it is to, uh, to thing now they in this case here this is the the advantage of this is is the contract period is much less and uh and you basically don't have to to pay for the whole uh project they would run, own it and run it for six years and it's just like the last one they make their money on the depreciation and on the uh uh car, the credits they would get you know the, the rebates Uh, the last last way to do one of these things is with sponsorships. Been done a few times, not commonly done. Uh, and this is where you go out and get uh, Red Bull or uh, somebody like that, some green company that is also in the outdoor business, likes Moab, you know, think Trek or somebody like that. Uh, and, and they come in and, and we name the array after them and they get to claim uh you know, claim that they have a green power thing going in Moab and and uh, uh, make some money from that. Questions? All right, next steps. I'm just about done. Um, next steps is is really to form a uh, a team to. Uh, nail this down, uh, there, there's these financing options that I've shown you and then there's others. But I, I think that the, the commitment has to be twofold and that is uh, that, that we're gonna do this because of, mostly because of the green and partly because we're, we can maybe reduce the cost, we will reduce the cost uh, you know, by, by doing this. So the process, the process then going forward is to develop this team, 
which ha would have to have financial people in it and people that are just interested in making it happen to uh, develop the RFP uh, for the financing options. Uh, the other way to do it is, is just to have you folks uh, find money in the budget for it or, or a loan of some kind. And the other way is to seek, seek sponsorships. But this, so I guess the next step, the major thing really is, is uh, to put together a, a, a county team of people that would uh, make this happen. That's, that's it. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a great idea to, to continue to pursue this as an option, as a, um, as you suggested, a cost saving um, measure, um, as well as just sort of, you know, so a way for the county to take some leadership in developing a large scale, larger scale um, array in a place, as you also mentioned, that is so advantageous to, to such energy production. Um, and I think that this would be a great uh, thing to flag our um, our strategic development director, Chris Baird, um, and sort of um, getting some more uh, perspective and, and, and helping to build that team. Do any other commissioners have any questions or clarifications that they'd um, like to make at this time? So am I remembering correctly, you said it'll be about 0.4 acres is, would be the size of the array? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, there's the, the proposed site. Uh, if you remember the airport, there's that big, the, the parking lot out there. Uh, it would be just south of that, uh, by that substation that's just south of the big parking lot. If you remember where that is. In Tucson, they have a lot of solar arrays that are also covered parking. Yeah, that's a good alternative. Uh, you know, if, if we had the desire to put up covered parking on that parking lot, that would be an ideal spot for it. Um, thanks, Bill. I think this sounds really exciting. And um, I mean, if we could figure out a way for the county to finance it, obviously that would be the most return for the public um, in the long run. So yeah, I'd be really curious to see what Chris has to say about it. Yeah, I think so too. That you know, that you got to remember that since we're already paying the twenty-five grand a year uh, for power, uh, you know, this, the the only question really is is uh, since we're already outlaying that money, and some of that would be would would go away if we. Uh, but if we had a solar array, the question is the question between the different just budgeting for it or going through with one of the more expensive financing methods is just how long it takes to pay it off. It really comes down to a question like how long do you want to do that? Okay, I guess that, uh, if, what I'd like to find if I could uh, going forward would be uh, one of you folks or, uh, one, or somebody you could designate that would uh, become the uh, uh, representative of, on the council for this project. So I'm not asking for that now, just I think that would be a way forward. Yeah, I think to that end, we've had a, a couple of commissioners at least that have uh, you know been uh, working with you and, and I think that that is definitely um, something that shouldn't be too hard to, to keep moving forward. Um, and I, I really appreciate all your efforts in facilitating this. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So I, I had failed to announce that that was, we had jumped to item B um, in the presentations. Uh, that was B that we just completed. And then now we will scoot back to item A, and that's the first presentation we had scheduled, and that was the update from Southeastern Utah Health Department on COVID-19 in Grand County. And here's Brady Bradford, um, the Southeastern Utah Health Department Health Director. Hi, Brady, thanks for being here today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry I was a little bit late. I uh, got caught up and 
four o'clock snuck up on me. Um, I hope everyone is is doing well. Um, Commissioner Wojtek reached out to, to seek a little bit of an update and it is a good time to, to give that update. Uh, it's been a while. Um, the, the short of it is that um, Grand County, um, Southeast Utah, really all of Utah is in a markedly different position now than we were um, a month and a half ago. Um, if you just look at, at raw case numbers, um, we were averaging between 20 and 30 cases a day in Grand County, pretty much all of, of January. Since February 6th, we've had either one or two cases per day, no more than one or two cases per day, except for on one day when we had three cases. But uh, really over the past two weeks, it's been about a case per day. Uh, hospitalizations um, have um, maintained a, a fairly steady clip, but, but it's been manageable. Well, uh, one to two hospitalizations in Grand County the caveat there is that the data we're getting regarding hospitalizations has, has really taken a step back. Um, and this isn't a reflection on Moab Regional, but hospitals in general uh, have been much more reluctant to share data with us, um, particularly if they're uh, in, in Grand Junction on the Wasatch Front, whereas that data was, was readily uh, flowing back and forth during the, the height of this. Um, it's, it's been a little bit more protected, uh, ironically, as, as those case numbers uh, have dropped. Um, so uh, we're fairly confident in that number, but it, it's not as up to date as it used to be. Um, one of the questions that came in was, was about the transmission status that's been uh, really assigned to the counties throughout this process. And um, while that is, that's a status that's been helpful and, and counties, including Grand County, have made decisions based on that transmission status. Um, as far as what Utah will display, that will change within days. They will, that, that will be basically taken down in deference to the new CDC county um, um, community level status. They've, they've kind of, change the name of it um, from transmission status to um, uh, well it's really based on hospitalizations at this point so uh, if you've seen that you know according to, to Utah's current risk stat or uh, transmission status basically all of the state is still in high transmission um, if you now look at the switch over to looking up at the update the CDC has given um, per county um, has Grand County in a medium transmission level carbon and emery have switched to low and it gives guidance levels based on on those transmission statuses which again are, are quickly based on uh, COVID admissions to the hospital um, percent of staffed inpatient beds. Um, and um, that, that's, that's really it. <laughs> um, then based on that, if you're in a low transmission status, it says get, get vaccinated uh, and, and tested if you have symptoms. Um, if, if you're in a medium transmission status, it does say talk to your doctor about whether you might need to wear a mask and, and get vaccinated and tested if you have symptoms. And then if it were to switch to a high transmission or admission status, uh, it does recommend wearing a mask indoors in public and getting vaccinated and tested with symptoms um, and, and evaluating your risk status as an individual. Um, moving forward uh, from, from our point of view, vaccines will continue to continue to be readily available. Um, Testing um, is still pretty available. Uh, demand has dropped significantly and we will uh, pull back from a, uh, you know, all testing all day sort of a situation to, to scheduled 
times when testing was available based on the fact that we're really being, we're testing less than 10 people a day, often, you know, one to two people a day. Um, the same is generally the case for the mobile unit that uh, parks at the Grand Center. Um, their biggest day in the past couple of weeks was 17 individuals, uh, as opposed to a month ago when they were regularly doing 60 to 80 uh, tests uh, per day. Um, but we will, we continually want vaccines to be available, of course. Um, um, I, I, I get into these and I start talking, I start talking a lot and uh, interested to know if there are specific questions that, uh, that the commission has. So, so currently when, when we get an update um, from the health department with regards to our, if we're in medium high or low, is that now, have we transitioned to using the CDC community levels or, or the previous index or? So the, the update that went out last night was based on Utah's levels. We, we had a discussion with state partners yesterday and basically made the determination that really the data that went into Utah's transmission levels just isn't there anymore. It, it's not reliable enough to mean anything. And so it was yesterday afternoon that we kind of made a joint decision that we would transition to the CDC's levels, but that didn't kick in by last night, but by next week it will. And, and you expect the new community level ratings to be reported pretty consistently for the next two months? Yes, um, um, CDC updates them once a week. It's not a daily thing. Um, I expect it to, to be come up tomorrow and, and it's very likely that Grand will shift to low, but I'm not positive. Um, they're right kind of on the border of those numbers of, of going to low. Um, but that's that's where we'll put our updates and, and um, that's what you'll see on Utah's website as well. Okay, so pre previously the state was calculating some kind of high, medium, low index, and now it's going to be done at the federal level. There's a there's still a high, medium, low, um, but again, it's really based on hospitalizations now, um, and it's we had Utah had come up with its own really al algorithm to de to determine this, but it makes sense more now to to fall in line with kind of these national metrics. So a few, a few months ago, I, I was sort of looking in detail at the old way Utah calculated things. And one kind of weird artifact from our point of view is that it looks only at Utah hospitals, even though one of the near big hospitals to us is in Grand Junction, Colorado, you know, we're not, um, is, is the CDC thing, does it take into account that people cross state lines and that the, the nearest, you know, the relevant hospitals might not be in the same state? Or the um, same most of that metric is based on uh, residents of the county that are hospitalized. Um, that is a big part, but there still is a weakness in, in that it will primarily, in terms of hospitalizations for Grand County, it will look at Moab Regional Hospital and the utilization happening there. It won't really, it doesn't really have a broad radius uh, touching on those uh, hospitals that will receive patients. Okay. So, so it sounds like then that this, this metric, which you know maybe it works well for big, high population counties, but for a small rural counties like ours, we can expect a lot of noise and unexpected results in the ratings. Um, if if the trends, the current trends continue. Um, I don't, I don't expect tons of noise there. If for whatever reason we, we did have, you know, two people that were feeling unwell and, and ended up hospitalized for a day or two, um, and it was right on the, the transition date uh, from one week to the next, that might cause a little bit of noise. But um, generally speaking, I, I don't think we'll see, um, we'll see it swing from one end of the spectrum to the other just because 
the, the trends look so good right now. Are there still, um, I think you might've already answered this, but are, are there still vaccines being administered in Grand County? And, and if so, or even, or even anecdotally from, from neighboring counties, um, if you know, people are still you know, coming in to get a, get a vaccine for the first time, say, um, is there anything that you've noticed that is driving that sort of participation? Or in other words, you know, what, what might we be able to do to encourage um, you know, yet more participation? Because I know it can be, we've made it this far, and so it seems kind of hard to imagine. So what, what could be driving that, you know? Um, so what we've seen, because there still are vaccinations being given, and there still are our first, first doses being given, though that, that number is very small. I, we, we had a couple um, over the last week or so, and I made a point of asking them, you know, what was happening, and in, in the three cases that I know about, it was being very close to someone that had had a scare and uh, finally kind of changed, changed their uh, thinking on, on what they would do. Um, there was one other case where a doctor had been really encouraging it for months and they finally decided to, to heed their doctor's advice. But it seems to be that personal connection that really is helping to in, inform this, that type of decision at this point. And is there still any surveillance uh, through wastewater? Is that, is that still something that is actively being engaged in? Yeah. Yeah. There, there still is wastewater sur surveillance and um, it's actually pretty neat to look at. Um, for much of 2020 and, and the good part of 2021, when generally speaking, you know, the county's levels were, were pretty low, it wasn't helpful. <laughs> but um, as we looked at, at late fall and, and through winter, when those numbers were pretty significant, wastewater data always seemed to be a leading, uh, leading indicator that, um, you know, the degree that we integrate this in, into future COVID uh, surveillance or other diseases, that's actually a pretty good benefit. Um, it was hard for us to recognize through much of that, you know, uh, that earlier period, just because we didn't have the numbers, but um, I ought to find that. Uh, that's sent to me every once in a while from DEQ. I have to find that and, and send it to Mallory and she can distribute it to the commission because it's, it's pretty cool data to look at. <laughs> Yeah. Do any other commissioners have any questions? Uh, Brady, did you have any other um, sort of information to share at this point? Um, you know, I appreciate uh, the effort and, and the hours that's gone into this. It's, it's not over yet, but uh, um, I know from our, our end, it, the response has uh, dropped down significantly. I don't know how many commissioners will uh, check up on our dashboard for COVID data. A, a lot of that will be changing and, and dropping off because we're not getting sufficient information. Uh, you, we won't see breakthrough data anymore um, just because the amount of effort to get that number uh, really isn't uh, pay off anymore. But so some of those things will change, but the, the dashboard will remain. Um, I don't think I have much more than that. Well, I wanna thank you and your staff. And you know, I know it's, it's a sort of a point that's come up in the board of health meetings that I attend, which is that, you know, it's been hard to obviously through the pandemic to address all of the, you know, public health needs, critical public health needs that the health departments do serve to our public. And, and I hope that this, um, this sort of winding down, hopefully, um, you know, will continue to allow you and your, your offices to, to serve those needs, um, you know, rather than just responding in the, in the great way that you've had to the, to the crisis. I, I appreciate that. And we, uh, we've been readjusting. <laughs> At the same time, we, we haven't, you know, we've been burned a couple times. We're very pretty sure that, that we're going to hold 
steady on, on the case numbers now, but we've been burned so often that we're not totally committed to that. Yeah, and I, I know it doesn't uh, necessarily pertain to us, but I know uh, congratulations on the uh, new facility that um, that you were able to move into and in, in price and um, and it seems like there's some interesting conversations happening here um, in Grand County as well with regards to um, providing the best facility for for offering your services. Yeah, that'll be a, a conversation I'd, I'd like to have with the commission when the time's right. Uh, we've been talking with uh, the free health clinic about um, the campus, USU, USU's campus that, that they're planning to purchase and, and becoming a partner there and the possibilities um, to, to, to be really a, a campus for serving people that is a lot more uh, friendly and accessible than I think both of our buildings are now. Absolutely. Um, I may, I, Mary, I saw that you had just jumped on. I don't know if you had any um, questions that you might have prepared. Not, you still have a chance here before Brady signs off. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's why I jumped off because for whatever reason, I kept trying to say something during the last presentation and was not. No heard. worries. Uh, I don't have any questions at this point. I'm okay. glad we're. I think I'm glad things are slowing down. <laughs> Same safe. here. Let, let's keep up the, the good trend to that to that effect. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Bradford. And we'll see you next time. We'll be in touch. Thank you, commissioners. All right. All right. Bye. So that, that concludes our presentation section for today's meeting. And we'll swing right into department reports. And that's item C. And we'll have, we have a report on land use code updates um, pri and prioritization process. And I will invite Elisa and maybe perhaps even John to lead that discussion. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you, Commissioner Wojtek. Okay, so this is a presentation on the land use code updates that we've been compiling over the last three months and started out as kind of a simple list and then it's been expanded and new ideas have been brought to the table. So at this point, there's kind of a lot on the table and we're requesting um, the commission to provide some direction regarding the, the updates and prioritizing you know, what, what feels more urgent and what's more feasible to do um, in the immediate, immediate future. Um, so I'll just, briefly discuss each of these and kind of the background and potential um, issues for consideration within each of the updates, but they're really not, I'm not asking for a uh, real discussion on the, 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 the content of these, but just more of a prioritization. And Lisa, before you dive into the content, I just wanted to make note real quick that we do have a, a couple of members of the planning commission um, presence today as well, um, potentially for, for questions as Emily Campbell and Bob O'Brien. Thanks, sorry to interrupt, go right ahead. Great, that's good. Okay, so within Article 3, the use regulations, there are two sections that have been flagged for updates. And one of those sections is 3.3.2 accessory dwelling units, which needs to be updated per state uh, code requirements. At the very minimum, this update would need to include defining an internal ADU or IADU versus an external ADU, along with appropriate standards for IADUs, which currently our code doesn't um, have anything regarding IADUs. Um, in addition, while we are updating that section, we could consider following in the footsteps of Moab City's recent code update to allow additional ADUs on parcels of a certain size. So one option would be to allow an IADU in addition to an EADU on parcels larger than say 20,000 square feet or roughly half an acre. Um, but uh, so the, the section for ADU is kind of, we could go two ways, we could keep it very simple and just um, do the bare minimum of what we need to do to bring it up to the state code requirements or we could go a little further and provide um, uh, you know, the allowance for additional ADUs to kind of increase the housing stock. 
Um, the other section in Article 3 that has been identified for updates is Section 3.3.3, Standards for Temporary Uses, in order to include regulations for special permits for things like music festivals, flea markets, pop-up restaurants, art fairs, etc. Currently, our land use code does not provide a path for permitting these types of temporary land uses or special events. In Article 4, Section 4.6 OAO has also been identified for updating in order to streamline and clarify the permitting process and requirements for each stage of development being the district application and the site plan review application. Two major changes to that section to consider would also be to replace the dude ranch category with a special purpose retreat category to provide a permit process for educational art or wellness retreats in the form of small scale glamping developments. And another possible consideration would be to include a requirement for parcels over a certain size or in a certain area to provide a conservation easement on sensitive lands, which could include scenic view sheds. As for housing, there have been a couple of suggestions for updates, or more than a couple actually, um, but specifically to Article 6, affordable housing, as well as a possible addition to Article 4, special purpose districts. The Article 6 amendment would include possibly replacing Section 6.14, assured housing, with a new requirement for all de new development to pay for affordable housing with some exceptions. This would solve the OAO campground issue in terms of being able to require affordable housing or a fee in lieu. And it would also allow the county to really start seeing results for affordable housing related to new development across the board. Um, planning and zoning staff has been looking at the Summit County model for guidance on this and how to implement uh, this program. And just to note also that it would be very similar to the assured housing section that we already have, but it would just kind of widen the, um, the purview to include other types of development instead of right now we just have it set for single family dwellings that are larger than a certain size and um, hotels, which we're not seeing any hotels being developed that we can apply the, the fee to. Another method for accruing affordable housing funds that would be um, as an alternate to this, to the one that I just discussed would be to um, apply a relatively small percentage surcharge or impact fee for all building permits across the board. More research would be needed though to fully examine the feasibility and effectiveness of this strategy. And one last update that is being discussed at the Planning Commission is to implement an overlay district to allow long-term rentals in the form of a camp park. Um, I'm going to share my screen briefly on this one. The idea um, would be to include a range of housing types, but so far the main intention is to promote spaces for tiny homes on parcels no larger than three and a half, three to five acres. Um, the purpose of this update is to provide an immediate solution to the housing shortage for our seasonal workers, as, long, as well as long-term residents who are just starting out in their quest to build equity and become homeowners. The special purpose overlay district could be modeled similar to the HGHO program with a sunset date, a maximum unit cap and eligible parcels map and eventually it would be um, ideally obsolete when the general plan 2030 future land use map is adopted, which will identify areas for increased density, including apartment complexes and condos. So like I said earlier, the, there are many potential code updates and they all feel somewhat urgent. Obviously we can't do all of these at the same time, which is why we're asking to have some direction in terms of prioritization from the commission. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yep. Um, on section, I don't know if it was four or six, but where you were talking about affordable housing requirements for de new developments. Uh-huh. Um, is that similar to something I've heard 
other people talk about maybe in regards to the city where this is actually also a requirement for every new subdivision or like mm -hmm. building of apartments or something to set aside affordable housing is that right it's very similar but i think what the, the city is starting out doing is something more along the lines of um restricting units for actively employed households versus actually applying um uh restricting affordable or restricting units a certain amount of units to be below market rate so more affordable versus um occupied by workforce that's how i understand what the city's doing right now but i think they're they're wanting to bring it to that next level eventually to um require units to be affordable so you're going to look at similar options for the for that code update potentially Right, it would be similar to that, to what the city is doing, but it would actually be um, probably a little bit more broad in terms of applying the, um, requiring new development to either pay a, a fee in lieu or provide units that are below market rate. And so that would be for subdivisions, but it would also be for lots of types of developments. And we could talk about what should be exempt from that, but. You know, obviously, building a, a single family home, uh, your pr your principal residence or an ADU, um, anything that would be affordable already, those would be exempt from that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, are you are you, are you hoping to get um, sort of some input from us with regards to these num like in prioritizing these? these numbered sections and their subsections, or how can we best uh, you know, help you today and, and create something? So, to yeah, the way I, I listed these in the agenda summary is um, arbitrary. Like the, we don't have to, if we're tackling article three, we don't have to do the ADUs and the temporary uses. Those can be separated out. Um, so really it's kind of just each section, each individual section could be prioritized. Something that would help me with the prioritization is a couple of things. I would like to know from the Planning Commission and also from Christina, which one of these are you feeling uh, the greatest pressure that you are getting uh, applications and such that uh, this that puts a little more pressure on having it done? And the other question I have is, I wouldn't mind knowing which one of these are fairly easy fixes. I mean, which one could be done quickly and just be off the table? Did, did I make myself quick, clear on the two questions I have? I think so. I'll go first and then I'll let um, Elise and John, if they want to um, weigh in. Um, I think from a community perspective, the community is asking us to work harder on housing. Um, you know, certainly there's plenty of developer and owner interest on us working through the OEO a little bit more um, in hopes that they could um, move forward on some of their proposals. In terms of housing, we have a few more days left of the general session, and there's a couple of really bad housing bills. Um, and I don't want to talk too specifically about them at the moment. But what I will say is, um, as soon as the general session is over, I'm going to be asking you to take some very specific um, steps and somewhat of an urgent matter um, to possibly beat a later special session or certainly the 2023 general session, where I think the legislature has tipped us off on where they're going on some of the uh, housing solutions but I'm not ready to go into more specific detail now before the general session closes. Yeah, Mary, if I could just, or Gabe, if I could just jump in there. Um, the impact fee one for the building permit does require a code, a codified analysis usually of what the costs are. So different than evaluating what capital improvements need to occur on sewer and water, very similar to that. And you need to actually gauge that and then come up with a formula that's going to work. And as Lisa mentioned, uh, as you start assigning this for the increase in number of units, because it's really an increase in, in number of units for sewers, an increase in, 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 in service capacity and for water the same way. 
So that impact fee analysis, I think, is on Chris Baird's uh, agenda to start. And so that would be one of those things we would put into that, potentially into that analysis for formula. That's going to take some time. Um, Christina's point about uh, we are looking in the land use study. Uh, there's a short term, medium term, long term changes to the land use code. We're looking at a whole housing rewrite uh, as part of the land use analysis. So that's that's medium term. Uh, and then what Christine is trying to hit on is what the state requirements are currently. And Christine, I should say, Elise is hitting on and Christine is hitting on the ones that are coming up, uh, which is a bit of a a bit of a crapshoot in some ways, uh, although there are some things, I guess there's some things that she's sensing that are happening there. So we wanna keep, keep ahead of the curve as much as we can, but we really need to do some good planning on strong land use uh, and get some good strategies together, which as you know, uh, is being worked on, Mary. So uh, I, you know, the ADU one's is pretty straightforward. Uh, this the easy one is to just do what the state law is. The little harder one is to actually allow for more residential units uh, in, in the area. There needs to be a formula that works for people that changes the character of a community in a lot of cases. So it's not an easy thing to jump into. So I, I you know, I think that the easy one is to follow state law, make the ADU change. Uh, the OAO analysis uh, is is kind of interesting, I think. And I think Elise has got it there, kind of. I think the temporary use one's an easy one too, uh, is the reference towards uh, conservation easements and workforce housing bundled together with the OAO at the same time. And I'm not sure if that's immersed in that discussion, at least I don't know, I didn't see it really pop up by itself. Well, the the only way that we can address, we can't, I, the way that it's set up right now with uh, requiring assured housing for developments is that the, the special purpose, the OAO section references the 6.15 assured housing section. Um, so it just says that for uh, overnight accommodation developments, ex, uh, please you know, go to 6.15 and, and, and follow all of the requirements for assured housing. Once you go to 6.15 and look at the assured housing requirements, that's where campgrounds are exempt. And so really it would need to be an update to our assured housing section in order to um, to put campgrounds into the category of, a, of affordable housing. So I, I wanted to echo something that Mary Mary said, which you know the the big question you were asking us is prioritization. But I I think you know the the things you might do some of them are are quick and easy and some of them take a long time like you know, things that require an extra economic analysis. So. I, I, I don't even if if there's something that takes a long time that's really important but there's something of moderate importance that could be done quickly and easy easily I think it makes sense to do them in parallel or even do the, the shorter thing first so I, I think we need to in you know setting priorities or, or timing for tackling these I think we also need to take into account how much work it, it the various things are and I think there's wide variability um, I don't think y'all should worry about that. I think the planning staff can address that on their own. So for example, with housing, I am going to require we just go ahead and, and hire BAA to update our nexus analysis. I think it's really important if we get into litigation, even if we could do it in-house that we use the same expert. Um, so let's say you prioritize housing first, for example, and we need this BAE update. Um, well, I mean, planning and zoning stuff would get started on that. They wouldn't just go idle while they're waiting. So then they'd move to the next level of priority. So so my personal opinion is y'all need to just set the priorities and planning staff will worry about when and how they can get it done. But I think some things are also more time sensitive than others. So I, I, I disagree. Um, I, the, the other thing I wanted to say is there's a, a lot of items that I think are of at least moderate priority that, it, that I didn't see on this list. Um, some of them related to housing and various things. So I, you know, if we're, if the purposes of this is set priorities, I don't think we should limit ourselves to the things on this list. And in either now or at some meeting in the very near future, maybe we could discuss some of these other things. But before I, to give just one example, um, an idea that's been talked about a bit is if we permit ADUs, they have to be for workforce housing. Um, that's a, a kind of a simple thing and it's consistent you know, with our general philosophy when we're giving away extra density and you know, there needs to be some kind of workforce housing strings attached. Um, anyway, 
So I, depending on what the chair wants, I could go into some of these things now or we could schedule time in the future, but I, I, I think there are things missing from this list that we're considering. I think there are things missing too. Um, for example, for me, the article seven subdivision update um, that I keep bringing up isn't here. I don't know why. So I am curious, maybe planning staff could speak to it. What is the most helpful thing for you um, in terms of really getting all of the possible items together in one place so that the commission can then work on this priority list? Um, well, the possibility, but Kevin's um, point about the ADUs and requiring um, the units to be uh, deed restricted for workforce housing, that's definitely on the table. It's just not, I, I didn't, I didn't want to get too in the weeds in terms of what we were going to be um, talking about in that section, just that there were some, the main consideration was to allow um, additional, like an, an internal ADU along with an external ADU on one parcel. Um, which would obviously increase the density um, on parcels to three units, three dwelling units. Um, and right now we do re deed restrict ADUs across the board to um, enforce that they are not used for nightly rentals with their, their long-term um, rent rentals or occupied by long-term residents. Um, that can definitely be discussed in within the ADU section um, and it has been brought up before. I apologize for not including it in the bullet points. But as far as um, Christi, uh, Christie's uh, mention of Article 7, I thought that Article 7 subdivision was in relation to Summit County's model for requiring all new development, which includes subdivisions, to pay for affordable housing and or a fee and move. I thought that was actually where we would address it is in 6.15 as an affordable housing requirement. In Article 7, you in subdivisions, you would reference that. You would reference it into sec to Article 6 um, by saying in all subdivisions must follow requirement for affordable housing, see Section 6.15. Uh, okay, well, and I appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to see it be a mix, either prioritize workforce housing or be a mix of the two. Um, so wherever we put that, fine. It just, to me, isn't um, highlighted in this list what exactly we're talking about. And then on the, o the OAO stuff, um, the assured housing we talked about that I feel like is, needs to be on the list specifically, water, um, we met with the Division of Water Resources and Mark Stilson confirmed that at least in, in terms of our North Corridor, there is zero water west of the Moab Fault. And I think we need to do a special, we need to treat that area specially and we need to work with our partner agencies to determine given that there is no water and that um, trucking in water, hauling water is unstable into the future, what uses do we want to allow west of the Moab Fault? I think that's a really important thing to include when we're talking about OEOs and that's no simple matter. Um, and then the development the agreement process that we've talked about a lot, especially with Entrada, right? How Wallingford led to changes in the state code last year that was effective in the summer that we haven't built into our land use agreement um, is a little bit broader than just the conservation easement issue that needs to get worked into OEO. I was just gonna remind, I think most of the private property up there is east of the Moab fault. fault. So I'm not aware well, of Well, we've had at that. least one recent application that was west. So if we need to at least address. The Entrada was west of the Moab Bowl. Yeah. And, and in, that same, um, in that same discussion with Mark, we talked more about water monitoring and the idea of impact fees going toward monitoring wells. So, but we've already talked about impact fees, but anyways, we could maybe highlight what those would be used for. I'm wondering if I'm just throwing out an idea and, and you guys can maybe hop in and, and clarify this, but maybe this is a Google Docs situation where we all go in, we, we prioritize, but we can also add things, I don't know, and, and clean it up before it comes. You know what I'm saying? Like we could sit here for hours and hours and hours. Well, I think we could just simply 
I, I think today what, what I think would help the planning commission and they could bring it back is you know, maybe we could do a straw poll. Like for me, my two, my, my priority would be to emphasize uh, the, like uh, the one about that's like Summit counties, everything that is going to involve increasing affordable and assured housing. Uh, way above worrying about streamlining and clearing fine permits for, uh, you know, dude ranches and things like that. I, I would put things that were higher on the list as, as housing and couple that with looking at the feasibility of water and impact fees. To me, those, you know, I would put those quite a bit above right now, uh, you know, I think we should look at, uh, you know, RVs and such as being part of assured housing, but I think uh, the development of livable spaces is more important right now and to get done. And then in conjunction with looking at the water issue and then so have the other things lower on the list that And then if possible, and if possible, if there's some that can be simply done quickly, I'd get those done right away. Get them off, get them out of the way. Um, so given the information that was presented to us in preparation for today and, um, you know, also being cognizant of, of, you know, other items that we might want on here, is there any, is there any member of the commission that wouldn't um, necessarily want to see number three, article four and six and associated housing solutions as, as the top priority out of, out of the information given to us today? I know it's kind of a loaded question a little bit based on the conversations we've been having about workload and, and ease of execution, but um, I guess I'll just throw that out there. Um, is, is that, is, does anyone object to that as, a, as something of a, you know, in a direction? You say those numbers again? Uh, just number three, sections A and B. Um, I agree, and I think you mentioned this, but also the development of a like multifamily housing overlay. Maybe that's similar to the RV park. Yeah, well, that the multifamily issue, I know it's a big one, and we don't really have um, very good zoning for multifamily currently, but I... <clears throat> And this could, this is just putting it out there, but it, and, and it could be changed. Is um, I, I feel that our direction has been so far to address the multifamily zoning as part of our future land use plan and the general plan update. If I could just uh, jump into prioritization thing here, uh, which which Greg has mentioned, we number one can happen anyway. Number one's going to happen. So one number one's easy. That's all part of state law. That's easy to codify. In fact, we can draft that right away. So it's not like these things are mutually exclusive. So one can be done. And not that I want to commit Elisa to something she can't get done, but I think that that one's pretty easy to get done. Uh, number three is a bit more challenging. Um, and then we're talking about affordable housing there as well. So you got to be careful with the impact fee because that's really going to be legally defensible. We don't want to be in litigation again, I don't think, do we, Christina? So it's got to be one of those things that we're careful about. The dude ranch one there again, I think that's an easy one. If 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 the commission sees that as an important OAO reference, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. But B and C on number two, uh, we've already had we've already seen some of those come forward. As long as there's water, of course, that's one of the conditions, uh, and then streamlining. So I think one and two are actually pretty straightforward as far as getting for the department to get that forward to the commission. But Lisa, do you not agree? Yeah, there's already been work um, underway back when we started um, on the OAO section as kind of a, a priority back in a couple months ago. So there was there's already been work done on that section to redline that and provide a draft copy. Um, it would just need to be kind of, you know, obviously everyone would want to see that and provide feedback on the specific kind of sticking points. But it's nope. feasible. Yeah, I, I'm going to try a different version of the comment I tried to make earlier. Um, 
a, a few a couple of months ago that the city in, in talking about you know the urgent need to do something about housing came up with a, a really big list of options and there was some discussion about which of these were you know feasible or you know and how long they might take or some of these we might not want to do at all I would be interested in seeing something like that in the county as well it could be I could copy a lot of ideas from the city list I think many of those are interesting and so if I mean, if we're going to have a meeting like that next week, fine, but it, I thought this was going to be the meeting where we give the planning department feedback on, you know, here are the things you, you know, you should be exploring. And I, I guess what I found a little bit confusing about this list is it's just a much shorter list of things. And, and I think Elise has pointed, Lisa has pointed out a couple of times that there's some of the stuff just would work better by making it as part of the general plan revision process. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I don't think that applies to all of them. So, and that could be part of the exercise that, you know, maybe there's some, something's a good idea we want to pursue, but it should be done as part of the general plan revision or the you know, land use code revision rather than some kind of separate thing that we're trying to get done more quickly. Um, but I, I don't, I guess what I don't want to do in this meeting is say, you know, rah, rah to some item on this list and then not hear anything for three or four months when there are other ideas that I think should be pursued and, you know, with at least as much urgency as some of the things on this list. So I don't, sounds like some people don't want to have the dis that discussion this time, but I'd like to have it soon. But we're always open. Our door's yeah. always open, Kevin. So if you want oh, to, through Gabe, so I'm just going to say, if you have anything, I like Trisha's idea that we can post a li that list, uh, some of the stuff that the city had was really outliers that we could post a list that we have already and put that out there and put it into categories like medium long range and put it into a general plan and put it into a Google Docs uh, for general comment, that kind of thing. And if you have any suggestions on what you want, it sounds like you've got some on the list, Kevin, and others do too, just let us know. Yeah, yeah I, 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 like I honestly, awesome. I feel like the this list has just evolved um, over time just based on the feedback I've gotten from the Planning Commission and a little bit of hearing some comments from commission members and as well as the attorney. Um, and I think that it's evolved in order to kind of consolidate those ideas and how we can, um, you know, address housing solutions. The, the affordable housing requirement for all development is kind of like the big solution. It's long, longer term, it would, it would take a while for that to see the effects of that on the ground, but it could get, we, we should get started on that. That seems like a good priority. Um, and that encompasses so much. Um, and I think that, so, and then in, ter in terms of the water, um, I do wanna quickly clarify, what are we actually talking about in terms of an update to the code in relation to water? Is that uh, to require an impact fee? Cause I know that has been discussed before, but I, I, I took it off the list because I thought the impact fee analysis is being done and we need to wait for that. And uh, and so I wasn't sure if we were ready to start drafting code updates for that. I think there's a few things about water. One is the impact fee um, analysis. I'm not up to date with what Chris is doing. So it's good to hear that's in the queue. A second piece is um, given DWR's input on not just property west of the Moab Fault, um, but also Cisco has no water and areas around Thompson outside of the SSD could be complicated. I do think we need to do some sort of like Northern unincorporated county um, water planning. Um, whether or not we want to allow water to be hauled in and what that looks like, because that is an unstable source into the future. Um, and then the third thing is the way we treat reviewing water period within the land use application process. Right now, our language is very broad and it does give us sufficient authority to deny um, applications based on a lack of water, et cetera. Um, but Chris Bear and I both agree that we need, want to beef up that section, work on it a little bit better. And a lot of other counties are doing a better job with what that land water analysis section looks like. So. That's another thing that's been on my radar. Um, and I guess why I have the floor, um, I can appreciate that some of these things are less complicated than others, but all this stuff takes a lot of time. And um, I do think our planning staff is pretty maxed out. You know, hopefully we move beyond the general plan process, you know, by end of spring. Um, but we also have uh, some other things. We just had a big meeting, for example, about 
create a book cliffs area plan. Um, so I'd still really like to see a priority list um, based on the commission's community priorities and then the planning commission work through that list based on what they can get to. So if something's easy, but it's down the list and something's stalled up higher, then, then they get there. But if you prioritize the little things ahead of the big important things, the big important things are going to get delayed in my opinion. Well, I would definitely put as my top priority would be uh, Article 4, the Section A. I think that is important. It, we, like she said, it, uh, we won't see things happen quickly, but I do think it's something we need to get done quickly because it's also something that could be taken away from us uh, within a year, our ability to do that. So in my opinion, I would put that as the number one thing that should be done as quickly as possible. And, I, and Mary, I think that you're, you're talking about, um, or just correct me if I'm wrong, the implementing the affordable housing requirements for new development. And that, yes. Okay. And that was what Christina had said is um, in her mind is priority. And it would start with um, requesting BAE to or contracting BAE to um, update the Nexus study in order for us to implement that. And I did confirm with the city, they just engaged BAE to help them. Um, so I, we had previously asked Corey, if you do that, please coordinate with us so we could go in on you with it. So that, that didn't happen, but there still might be a, a moment with the city to coordinate on BAE to get, you know, more value as well. Love to give Emily Campbell a chance to get, provide input. She raised her hand. Go, go ahead, Emily, on behalf of the Planning Commission. Thanks, What's your perspective? Yeah. Obi's here too, and staff has done a great job of summarizing our conversation yesterday. So I just want to add a couple small things just to contextualize. Um, one thing that we have seen is an increase of applications come in that have had a relation to housing, but we haven't had the tools in our tool belt to be able to respond. Um, other than to say we think there's more planning needed. So I know that with once litigation passes, revisiting density is something that is sort of an open question to get direction from the commission, but we're not opening that right now, which I understand. But we've also had this um, these multiple OAO um, applications come through where we have sought to at least provide guidance on the merits of the application as it related to housing and then the easement that you all considered at your last meeting. So, um, you know, that's one thing that we have seen come in and just as a planning commission, it sort of inhibits our ability to give recommendations that are, um, you know, really oriented to what we think the county should be doing with this uh, proposal or with this particular parcel. So that's one thing to keep in mind that we have seen some of those come through and likely to continue. Um, the second is uh, in our conversation last night, one of the things we recognized was that there were some many of these issues are very intertwined. And I think what could be helpful from the commission as you're working through this is not just to prioritize at the like project or code specific level, but to help us understand what you are uh, orienting to as an objective, what you think requires more planning, what we're not willing to touch right now. So an example might be looking at ADUs, um, you know, increasing the number of ADUs, increasing accessibility, we discussed the possibility of reducing parking requirements for them, can also have the impact of increasing density without the control of specific or overlays or dedicated spaces for that density. So that's something that could very quickly become a slippery slope. And we just wanna make sure that anything we're, we're spending our time on and asking planning staff to spend their time on from our perspective, aligns to the objectives and the priorities that the commission has at that objective level. Um, you know, so that's, that's just one example. As far as things you want more planning on, I think, you know, we saw this with the small area plan as an example of things that were coming through when we were asking the commission, give us guidance. And ultimately we decided we were gonna just kind of put a halt on applications in that area until we could do planning. I think looking at um, specific nodes for housing development, you know, obviously a lot of that is happening with the general plan, but that's an example of something the commission might wanna discuss as far as we really need answers to these questions before we direct planning commission to take up this type of issue. And then, um, you know, the, the HDHO question is obviously one we're not touching until litigation is behind us, but there might be others that we just wanna make sure we're aware of so we're not spinning our wheels. Um, so I realized that was a lot, but I think that's the big thing I just wanna bring attention is the, the ways that they are all, all very intersectional. And that's the thing we could use some guidance on um, from the planning commission's perspective. 
um, I, I can give a little perspective on that. I think like with the ADU example, it makes sense to integrate state code as it's easy, but I'd be hesitant to across the board increase density on every single plot of land in Spanish Valley without going through our general planning process. Um, and yeah, that one to me seems clear. I think all of these options do have to do with workforce housing. And um, so like, well, I don't know, maybe that's all I have to say. OB. Yeah, go ahead, OB. Uh, yeah, I think I, I would echo what Emily said. Um, for instance, as we talked about ADUs the other, the other night, and there was the idea that you'd have an internal ADU and an external ADU on 2,000 square, you know, I'm going to get that or right, 20,000 20, 20, 20, 20, square feet of land, uh, which would actually mean you could have six units per acre. And then the question is, you know, how do you rein that in in some areas in the county? Because as we always want to remember, if we try to start borrowing stuff from the city, we don't necessarily want the same density. And the only other thing I'd say is when Kevin said, uh, brought up the, um, the uh, idea of, I guess, workforce housing, I kind of thought to myself, well, I would be happy to have had this session. It wasn't to get people's ideas of kind of top priorities, whether they were on Alyssa's list or not. Uh, just because that's the kind of feedback we need. And maybe we can uh, do this on a Google Doc uh, because it's, it's helpful for us to know what's uh, foremost in your mind. And one of the things I happen to like are tiny houses that we didn't talk about, uh, but we want to know if there's opposition to tiny housing because it is actually housing that is more affordable than much of our affordable housing. And I think we don't have real affordable housing lots of time, even though we make efforts to have somewhat affordable housing. So we, we don't reach kind of toward uh, people who are really in trouble for housing. Anyway, that's my thoughts, but I'm happy to hear all kinds of ideas. So here's my partial, partial answer to, to Emily's question. Um, I, I think a, a unifying theme to a lot of these ideas is you know, we've, We've discovered in Grand County that if we just leave it to the, you know, an unrestricted free market, we're not going to get the mix of housing that we want. And we've already taken some big steps by making overnight rentals, you know, not allowed, you know, throughout much, much of the county. And you know, we did that in various steps. But I think what we've discovered is that, you know, people, you know, either people can kind of exploit some loopholes in the rules or people just love their second homes. And so we're, you know, I think you know, if I look at all the construction, I can see, you know, out my window right now, an awful lot of it seems to be vacation homes and things like that. And so I would like to look for ways, ideas similar to HDHO to just to guarantee that a large percentage of what gets built is, um, is workforce housing. And, and so I think we've already established the, the principle that if we're going to give away bonus density, it's not going to be unrestricted bonus density. It's going to you know, be like 80% workforce. The next places to look like, look for, for places where we're giving away extra density for free right now and, and <laughs> springs. So ADUs is one that I mentioned. I think there are also some zones in the county, I'm, I'm not gonna name them right now, but that are already pretty generous with density and maybe we should make them less generous with density and, and then you can bring it up, you know, with some something similar to HDHO. Um, so I, I think that's something that we should take a serious look at. And, and then another is, you know, if someone's going to subdivide a large parcel of land, maybe that gives us another hook to, to require something. So I, I think this is all sort of in the spirit of some of the other things that are on the list, but I, I think there's a broader array of tools that we can bring to bring to bear on this. So in light of this conversation, it does seem like a, some sort of collaborative documents. Um, you know, organized in some of the ways that um, Emily described with the way, you know, they might be interrelated and, and so on and so forth um, could be in order. That's a topic that's kind of, uh, that's an idea that's come, in, come up now a couple of times in, in this discussion. Um, so perhaps, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, a, a raw prioritization of what's been presented to us in the packet 
um, is in order at this moment more than um, sort of a continued development um, by way of a collaborative document to be able to suss out all of the ideas and, and coordinate and organize them respectively. Yeah, if I could just jump in there, Gabe, I think one of the things to add to that the Planning Commission, both OB and I think it was Josie, wasn't it, Emily? I think it was Josie that was part of that small working group on, on housing and land use code that we had. So I think it's just, it's touching base with that, maybe developing a list to Lisa uh, and some criteria. It's our job really is to highlight where, what the recommendations are, what the, what the challenges are, and, and to, to bring that forward with our best recommendation for you to take a look at. So I know that sounds really hierarchical, but that's really what our planning, planning job is, is departments. So, uh, and then that hierarchy as far as land use is really critical to this whole process. So let's take a look at the split zones down 191, which is a mess. It's not only a mess from a zoning perspective, it's a mess from a land use perspective. So, uh, and as Christina mentioned, the, the water in, impediments uh, need to be addressed for sure. That's part of that level of service analysis. So I'm making it sound like we've already on track and I think we are. Uh, it's just that it's going to take a bit more time. We're hoping for June as a delivery, which isn't too far away. And I realize we're going to get into the housing crunch again. It doesn't look like things will be much better. Uh, so trying to do some quick fixes, and that's really what Elisa's done here. She's tried to highlight where the quick fixes are. Shirt housing is a bit more of a quick fix, though. Uh, but anyway, we could draft a document, get it ready, work with OB and Josie, uh, and maybe Emily's got some more people to add, and then put that on a Google Docs and just let the commission know about that. Great, thank you, John. And 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 if you know, I just want to, if I could just close, like I, I, you know, it's a based on some conversations I've had with Emily, like it would really be great to explore some of these innovative ideas in the interest of getting them delivered and getting them online as soon as possible, um, because obviously there's this planning aspect of it, but then there, you know, then it has to you know, be, you know, the information of, of the possibilities have, have to be made made available to developers and then they have to execute their plans. Um, and so, you know, I would, you know, the, you know, uh, OB brought up the tiny home concept, which, you know, I'm really in favor of as well. And, and I know it's, it's going to take a lot of groundwork to be able to, um, you know, push that forward and get it online. And I'd love to see that happen sooner than later. So hopefully this process that we're agreeing on can, and, can allow us to still do that. Um, are, there, are there any other burning questions or comments before we um, close this discussion? We spent a good amount of time, so I feel like it'd be in the best interest of today's agenda to, to keep moving on. I just have one question I'd like to ask Christina. Are you comfortable, Christina, with this path forward? Sorry guys, we just got the amended language that's gonna prohibit us from regulating ATVs at all, including noise regulation. So I lost the last bit of the conversation as I've been studying this language and starting to send out alerts. It passed? No, the language just dropped from Bramble um, and Bramble gets what Bramble wants. So that's very concerning with three days left. All right, maybe we can, sorry about that, Christina. Thanks for being on top of that. Maybe we can circle back on that on our legislative update. Um, so with, with that said, um, I wanted to thank uh, Emily and, and Bob for being with us tonight and as well as John and Elisa, thanks so much. This is really productive um, and let's keep that production going. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday, John and Elisa and, and whomever else, uh, I guess members of the Planning Commission may be there too uh, for the open house. Great. All right, we'll move right ahead. We're gonna move into approval of minutes. Wow, it seems like we've gotten so much done and had such juicy conversation. And now we're back to the, the normal business that I'm used to doing right at the beginning. Um, so uh, we're moving to item D, uh, minutes for February 15th, 2022. Um, if anyone has any edits or corrections to suggest for those minutes, um, please do so now. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to, to approve them. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from February 15th, 2022. Thank you, Trish. Do I have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Hadler. I'm sorry, any I, I was slow to, slow to raise my hand. I, I did have a small correction, but I don't know. Oh. It's not that important. 
I, I think we should get it in there. What, yeah. What, okay. What, so uh, I, I think somewhere about halfway through, it says I offered some kind of substitute amendment, but it wasn't a substitute amendment. It was just an amendment. So it was just an amendment. Okay. Quinn, did you, did you catch that? Yeah, I got it. I'll fix it. All right. Well, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes with the uh, suggested edits by Commissioner Walker. Thanks for catching that, Kevin. I will I make a mo motion to approve the minutes from February 15th, 2022 with the su suggested amendments. All right. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right. Any further discussion? I will call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. That vote passes unanimously. Looks like 6-0. We still don't have Commissioner Clapper here with us today. All right, we'll move on to ratification of payment of bills. Grand County bills to be approved for March 1st, 2022. Total bills in the amount of $1,145,376.45. Total payroll, $299,557.73. Total bills and payroll combined in the amount of $1,444,934.18. I would entertain a motion to approve the Grand County bills as stated by the chair. So moved. And do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, I have a motion by Commissioner Walker, second by Commissioner Hadler. All those voting in favor to approve the bills, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes six unanimously, six to nothing. All right. We'll move on to commission member disclosures. Are there any members of the commission that uh, wish to make any disclosures today? Seeing none, we'll move right along here to general commission reports and future considerations. I'll just go by who's on my tile here. Uh, Commissioner Hadler. Right, um, on February 16th, I attended a Museum of Moab uh, meeting and the big takeaways from that were that uh, the museum board uh, voted to go to a quarterly uh, meeting system instead of a monthly with uh, more frequent uh, working groups meetings. Um, so the, the meeting structure for the museum is going to change. We also talked about filling uh, two board vacancies there. Um, then on the 17th, I attended the uh, water uh, discussion with Mark Stilson that um, Sarah and Trish also attended as well as Christina. Um, we talked about that a little bit. I found it to be uh, super interesting. There's was, there was a lot of great background um, that educated me about the uh, Colorado River Basin and um, water rights priorities uh, as well as some of the um, Topic at hand like like Thompson Water and the item that is coming up on uh, action item E about the um, Thompson Springs um, uranium tailings pile uh, water uh, issue and um, also future water monitoring in our valley. Uh, so that was that was that was a great meeting. Very very informative. Um, on the same day, I attended the preliminary discussions with Bill Hawley along with uh, Mary about the solar project at the airport. Um, on the 22nd, I attended the annual Chamber of Commerce retreat um, where they set some of the goals for the year. They also discussed uh, redoing their bylaws, um, voted in a new board member uh, who is Randy Martin. Um, among other things. And yesterday I attended a meeting with Josh Hansen, who is the Utah Raptor State Park uh, director. And we had, a, um, we had a meeting about the proposed camping and also a uh, trails inventory and kind of like looking at big picture recreation and trails in the park going forward. Um, another takeaway from that is that the uh, funding that was allocated to that park is, uh, isn't gonna go nearly as far as had been thought with inflation um, and especially for uh, infrastructure costs. So um, that's moving along a little bit slower than had been anticipated. And 
that's that's it for me. Thanks so much, Jack. Commissioner Hedin. Um, I will try to be quick. Um, so I, I've had a number of, I actually think three meetings regarding the Book Cliffs Highway um, since the 15th. And it seems like, you know, the county, but also various coalitions are making a lot of um, headway regarding the Book Cliffs Highway and the opposition of that. Um, I met with the Recreation Spe Special Service District. And as you can imagine, this is crazy. We talked about pickleball. And, um, you know, OSTA is ready to go and, and would love to see those courts there. So now it's just a matter of grant funding. And I know that Patrick Trim and Chris are working on that and, and just placement. There's some drainage issues, et cetera, and so on. As Jacques mentioned, I also went to the meeting with Mark Stilson. I just think the more my overall opinion on that, well, twofold. One, if people want to know more about that Colorado River Compact, and just get a sense of it, not that it's not an overwhelming topic. Um, Utah State University, if you just Google the future of the Colorado River, they have a whole department, um, you know, that is about the Colorado River Compact, and there's endless amounts of research out there, but I would highly recommend diving into some of that if you're interested in it. Um, but the so that was one takeaway. I think the other takeaway and something that we as a county really need to be just obligated to or dedicated to and Sarah's are already brought this up multiple times is groundwater monitoring so that we make sure that as we are developing we are doing it um, with the lightest touch as possible in regards to our water resources and so Mark talked about what the county could do to couple with the, the division to help with that. Um, and we had a planning commission meeting yesterday and we talked about what you guys just heard and we had another update on that Spanish Valley survey just to push that again, that is still out there. So please, you know, be pushing on people to be completing that survey and to get their opinions heard. And that's about it, Gabe. Thanks, Trish. Sarah. Um... Most of the things that I attended have already been talked about. Uh, let me see if I have anything else. Oh, I attended a really great meeting of the Canyon Country Restoration Working Group. It was this giant meeting of a bunch of scientists all talking about different restoration projects in action here in this area of the Colorado Plateau. Um, one, of the, one of the presenters discuss the UMTRA remediation and some of the, the work that's going into figuring out how do you get things to grow in really saline soils or the topsoils totally gone. Um, so I, I, yeah, it was very exciting to talk about all of that. Um, I also attended a monthly meeting, the monthly standing meeting with the BLM with Commissioner Walker and we discussed a variety of topics, including the Book Cliffs Highway, and I attended another county meeting about the Book Cliffs Highway as well. Um, I have been going through the Graham County Public Land Survey that we've gotten 92 survey results with lots of detailed information on um, different ideas from community members about land management in general. And so I've been tallying a list of those different ideas and I hope we can share those results in some dige easily digestible format soon. Um, and I attended that Thompson Springs water meeting, which we will discuss a little bit later in the agenda. Thanks, Sarah. Mary. It's been, the end of the month is always very quiet for me and uh, some of my uh, the solid waste special service district meeting was uh, postponed until tomorrow, so I don't have that to report on. And the meetings I did attend, other commissioners were there and they've already been reported on. So this is one of my shortest summaries. So thank you. No problem with that. I know you're staying busy. 
Commissioner Walker. Um, so over the past few weeks, I've spent some time with dealing with the, you know, the legislative committee and assessing bills, but I, I think Christine is going to talk about that in much more detail later in the meeting. So I won't say anything about that. Um, as Sarah mentioned, there was a meeting with BLM staff and some follow-up calls. Um, one of the things, so I, I want to highlight two issues. One, one is the Bookless Highway, and I think the pretty soon um, the county is going to be asked to write a letter to the BLM describing how this re request for a new right of way for the highway conflicts with our existing rights of way up there. Um, so I, there's. You know, been a smaller meeting of, of staff and commissioners, and I think we're moving forward to be ready to have that letter written. Um, we might also want to clear, you know, update our general plan to make it clear that it's sort of a long standing policy in Grand County that we that we don't think the Book Cliffs is a, an appropriate place for that kind of development. Um, another, another thing we discussed at the meeting with the BLM is just I, ideas for um, dealing with this big influx of visitors, we, we probably recall about, I think, almost exactly a year ago, we had some meetings and we gave them some very specific ideas of things we hoped they would do. And, and you know, for the most part, they have not done them, though they have been doing some other things. And so I, I think we need to, you know, continue to pay attention to that issue and, and hopefully nudge and assist the BLM in moving in the right direction. Um, I, I do think we you know, maybe need to change our approach and figure out you know, what are the things that they're capable and interested in doing and take that as a starting point. Um, so I, I think that will continue to come up in the future. And, and yeah, this, seconding what Sarah said about um, getting to the next phase of development of the public lands proposal, I, I do think in sometime very soon, um, we should plan on a, a long workshop where we can all discuss it together um, and also some additional ways for the public to provide input, you know, via, you know, spoken testimony, you know, all that stuff. So that's another, you know, big thing. <laughs> I'm failing for words. I know another big um, time commitment to an hours in the future, but I, I think in the long run, it's worth it. Thanks, Kevin, that all? All right. Um, and as far as my own um, reports, let's see, I um, I had an informal meeting, uh, lunch meeting with some, some board members of the Chamber of Commerce and just mainly to focus on how we can open up better lines of communication with the chamber and, and just, um, you know, focus on collaborating more just so that we can sort of avoid misunderstandings and miscommunications um, moving forward. I think that that would be in the best interest of um, sort of the, the community at large. Um, I attended the general plan steering committee meeting to, to be involved in the, or to help plan for this uh, Thursday's open house. Uh, you might've seen, I wrote an op-ed in the paper, also trying to inspire some participation in that open house. So we're really hoping to, to see the public out there. Hopefully we get a nice sunny Very day. Very good like, article, Gabe. Very good yeah. article. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I attended the Southeastern Utah Association Lo Local Governments meeting. Um, oftentimes the, the more interesting items from those meetings are from the federal delegations, um, which I think was the case in this time as well. Uh, Senator Lee, I was, there's a couple of federal bills that I wanted to flag. Senator Lee, is working on what, what he's calling the Houses Act, and I can forward along information. Um, but it's the the gist of it is amending the Federal Land Policy and Management Act to authorize the sale of federal land to address housing shortages and other purposes. Um, so it might be of interest to us in some way, shape, or form to um, be active one way or another in that effort as we. Um, you know, perhaps get more information and see how that might apply to Grand County. Um, and also, I was alerted by um, actually a, lo a local reporter, Sophia Fisher, about um, a bill by Senator Danes of Montana called the Gateway Community and Recreation Enhancement Act, which I think we were all alerted to. Um, and that sounds very promising. Um, 
And I think that it could be a real opportunity for Graham County to have some leadership um, and input um, as that gets processed. Because, uh, you know, you read through the language of the bill and um, it's, it's, you know, it even calls out things like cooperative agreements and, and um, you know, management issues and all of the sorts of things that we um, confront, um, you know, pretty constantly. Um, so just wanted to flag two federal bills and, you know, perhaps we should um, strategize on how we can um, best engage on those. I know, um, and that leads into, I met with the lobbyists along with a couple other commissioners um, and met our lobbyist, Cody Stewart, spoke on a number of bills and he certainly has, um, <clears throat> uh, he certainly has experience in Congress. Um, and so I think that that would probably be a good place to start in terms of engaging on those federal bills. Um, and let's see, I think that that's probably all I have to report on at the moment. So I think that that um, concludes our section of commissioner reports. Elected official reports. Let's see who we have on. Chris, Christina, you've been usually waiting for the legislative update, but if you- I want will to do one quickie. Um, we, today is the first day of our new CJC director, Brooke DeGraw, and we're very, very excited about her. You might remember Brooke, she grew up in Monticello. There's a bunch of DeGraw kids and she was the prior executive director of CKV and she was the chair of the Wabi board. She has about 20 years of business and operational administrative experience. So we couldn't be more delighted. I have um, introduced her to all the MDT partners and there's still a lot of work to do. I spent the day, uh, most of the day today with her and onboarding her. Um, but I've neglected to send a welcome email with the commission. So I will do that. And I hope each of you will give her a warm welcome. Great. Thanks, Christina. I know, Brooke, that was a great catch for the county. Good news. Um, let's see. And then I see Quinn's on. Did you have any updates, Quinn? Uh, no, obviously we have an item later in the agenda and we'll discuss that then. So fair enough. All right, moving right on ahead to the commission administrator report. Mallory. Um, I think most of things I attended were mentioned by other commissioners. Uh, the only thing I would add is something Trish forgot, which is that we did meet with Sarah Melnikoff just to start a, a brainstorming session about options for um, some kind of a homeless warming center or a crisis center. I'm not sure the proper terms, but we will be continuing to meet with her and others and continuing with the process of brainstorming solutions. So other than that, I don't have anything else to report. Thanks, Mallory. Okay, we'll move right along to general business and action items. Um, I see it's 5.53. We have a 6 p.m. citizens to be heard coming up. So if you are on the call right now to give comment, we're going to jump in first to our first action item because I, you know, I, I have a feeling that we may be able to sneak it in. Um, but if we keep you waiting, I, do, I am sorry, but hang in there. We'll do citizens to be heard after the first action item here. Thank you. Um, so we'll move right along to item E, approving a letter of support for a pre preliminary agreement between the Thompson Springs Special Service District and Uranium Mill Tailings Remedial Action for a feasibility study regarding the Green River Pipeline concept. And here presenting is JR John Ripley Corkery, chair of the Thompson Springs Special Service District and Commissioner Hadeen, or Hadler, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, no. Yeah. Well, I told John he didn't need to um, attend. So I think Jacques is going to take this one away. Yeah. Take it away, Jacques. Thank you, Gabe. Um, and it is exactly what, what Gabe said in the description of that. It, we would be approving a letter of support for um, this agreement, uh, basically just to get the ball rolling with the special service district of uh, Thompson Springs and UMTRA on um, the feasibility study for, for uh extending the pipeline out to Thompson. Um, we did meet with the with um, Mark Stilson uh, and Christina was there and that meeting informed most of the last paragraph of the letter, if you guys have uh, read the letter. Um, and uh, I think this is a great step, so. 
Thanks, Jacques. Yeah, this has been on our radar for a while, and I do appreciate all the work everyone's been doing and meeting and fully vetting the concept. And I can see that in the work in this in this letter and this other associated associated documents. Um, were there any were there any questions or comments um, that anyone wanted to bring up now before um, discussing? Yeah, I, I mean, I have concerns about the middle part of the letter, which is is sort of reads as boosterism for significant growth in Thompson. And it, to me, it seems kind of inappropriate to include those things, given that we're doing general plan up. You know, we have we have a way that we assess these things. And to me, it, it just seems like a, a very big sudden change in Crane County policy to suddenly say, you know, we want to see a lot of growth in Thompson. Thompson. I would rather see that discussion happening um, as part of the general plan revision, where we can get a lot more public input and have a lot more time to consider the pros and cons. So I'm just wondering if there's some way to edit the letter to, you know, keep the beginning and the end. You know, so still ask for the water right, but you know, not. We could we could work on that language. It did come from the SSD, admittedly, um, but what's at stake is UMTRA possibly donating not just water rights but infrastructure worth millions of dollars. So th there there needs to be more than just we want your water rights. Um, we need to convince UMTRA this is a place that they should be interested. Um, that's why I didn't bother revising that language, but certainly that's up to the commission if you want to. Well, I mean, if it, if it's if only UMTRA is ever going to see that language and and it's not going to bias our future planning decisions around Thompson, like then maybe it's fine. But I I, I do I, I think it's an open question. And I, I guess through this whole process, I don't think the availability of water should drive our development plans. It sh you know, should be the other way around. Um, that is the point of the last paragraph to say we support um, seeking funding and studying this further, but we want to specifically understand whether within the compact analysis, uh, this is a stable water right and whether what the impact of the millennium drought mm -hmm. is on development in Thompson. Yeah, and I, and I don't have any problem with the final paragraph, but anyway, I, I if you, you know, if, if we're all clear that this is just some kind of thing we're saying to convince UMTRA and it's not what we really think about, you know, that we're being a little bit dishonest um, and we're clear on that, that, that's fine. But if, but if we're sort of, if this is the be, you know, beginning step in deciding that, yes, we want to see a lot of growth in Thompson, which is exactly what the middle of the letter reads like, I, I'm reluctant to support that. So. Well, I think that they do. I'm sure we'll definitely see this letter, but it's my understanding the SSD will use it as part of state and possibly federal um, funding and grant applications. So I can't say exactly who's going to see it. Okay. So I, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm not in favor of the letter with the middle parts included, but I, I would be in favor of if that were sort of eliminated. I, I, I think I, I think I agree with your comments, especially with regards to number three. Um, it does feel a little bit gratuitous, um, and I felt like, yeah, I, I felt like I even made it when, when, JR, when JR came to present to us. I felt like maybe there was even more than me, sort of that you know gave a little pause when sort of building up the you know all of the myriad possibilities. Not that we don't want to see possibilities in Thompson, of course we do, but um, within reason and within the you know, uh, you know, typical planning long range processes that we go through. And, and obviously, you know, the conversation about feasibility of water um, is, is kind of one, one conversation. And then, you know, if there is available water, what to do with that is kind of an, uh, a, an entirely different conversation. I, I get this is kind of, uh, you know, in some ways, a, a brochure to, to sell the, sell the idea. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think number three, I, don't, I, I could live with number three being removed. Number two doesn't really offend me too much as far as what, you know, what it's sort of promising. Are there any other um, comments or questions or does someone want to make some uh, a motion or? Um, this issue is a little bit tricky for me. I think it's really important that we secure that water right and um, for the future because those springs that are the source water for Thompson right now are diminishing and have been diminishing consistently. 
I also think that it's um, the infrastructure upgrades required um, and that the way that the preliminary plan was to pay for that is going to necessitate some dependence on growth unless we totally rethink a creative funding mechanism. So basically what I'm saying is that I think we should secure this water right and I'm not sure if we should plan on growing Thompson exponentially because that isn't this process right here, but it's important to secure the water right. Um, and I'm, and also the issue needs to be studied like the payment plan, how much the infrastructure costs. And the only way that they're gonna get funding for it to be studied is, is if we give support. So I don't know, I'm, I'm in support of this even though the, the issue is complicated and I'm not sure if I'm in support of development in Thompson. Well, the reality is that they're gonna need that water. They may need that water just to stay afloat. And that's where that point of divert, right? So um, if the spring keeps going in the manner that it's going, so they need it regardless. Could we take out out section? Could, Go ahead, Mary. Sorry. Could we just uh, take out the sections that say uh, stop after project, and then stop the part that says and it may allow, because that's really not what we're wanting. We're not wanting to move forward and allow something. It just take out that section all the way to the end of three, and then conclude with the final paragraph. Wouldn't that uh, get what we want, the water rights and the feasibility study without mentioning that we want to grow Tom Thompson? That would be my motion to approve the letter uh, with the deletion of the wording from after the word project in the second paragraph to the end of item three. That's my motion. I'll second that. All right. Any further discussion on that piece? Do, does anyone think that taking out those uh, three points may affect um, the decision uh, to to help us procure the, those water rights? I don't think so. I I. I... I've talked to Russell and the people at Umter. I mean, I don't think they have any problem with it. I mean, they have it and they're either going to close it or, or grant it to somebody and, and it's not going to cost them any money to give it to us. So really that, that's what we're wanting is the water rights and the infrastructure that's there. And we really, the other is kind of fluff. Um, Hmm. I wonder if we, I know we're getting way into the weeds here. I'm sorry, but I wonder if we put something like, you know, this would allow um, Thompson to, to maintain its viability as its primary water source has been diminishing in this mega drought. I don't know. I, I don't know. Should we just rework it? Yeah, I mean, and it's kind of- That, it's that kind sounds of like a good sentence, yeah. It's I don't kind know, of curious like, that, that, that that consideration would be included in the letter. I mean, it's like a matter of survival. Wouldn't that be the first bullet? <laughs> well, it is complicated because they have another undeveloped spring water right, which is also diminishing, which they're going to try to develop in the meantime. So, I, but I think we could include that sentence. It was a good sentence, Trish. <laughs> that makes sense to me. I'm not, not in my, repeat that. In, my motion, no, no in my motion to include that sentence after project. Or, or we could do an amendment. Which do you prefer, Chair? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, an amendment would be would be good. Let's let's go through that motion. Let's go through that process. <laughs> Trish, do you want to make propose the amendment, or should I try to repeat what you said? No, I can't remember. I can barely remember my last name. You you were on fire. It sounded really good. <laughs> we can find. We can get it off the tape um yeah so maybe so i i i'll move to amend the motion that you know so in the spot where where mary's original motion deleted a bunch of text we're going to substitute something saying that you know securing this water fight is water right 
is very important to the continued viability of Thompson and its and future growth um, in, in light of, you know, just general uncertainty about water in the West with the drought or something. And, and if someone wants to tinker with those words, but keeping in the same spirit, I think that's fine. Yeah, so. Great, there was a, a motion to amend the original motion by Commissioner Walker, do I have a second? For the I'll motion? second that. All right, further discussion on that? All right, um, I'll call a vote to amend the original motion. Um, all, all those voting in favor say aye or raise your hand. That passes unanimously. And are we still on the hook to vote uh, for the on the original motion? Yes. Okay. And I will, um, let's see, the original motion was made by Commissioner McGann and seconded by Commissioner Walker. Um, any further discussion? All right, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you all. All right, it is 6.06. Um, I really do appreciate if there's anyone been wait, uh, citizens um, that have been waiting to make comments. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Um, you will be, um, you are invited to make um, public comment now. We ask that you unmute and please state your name and, and please limit your comments to two minutes or less. I've got someone with a phone number ending in 6876. I'm not sure if that's a member of the public that like to give comments. Um, I also see Jennifer um, also on the Zoom here. If you'd like to make comments, please do so now. That, that's my number, this is Larry. Hi there, thanks Larry. Can you state your full name and, and thanks no, thanks for coming. Well, it's Larry Ellerton. I'm not sure, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm just listening in. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs> hi, Larry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would just uh, hi all. I would just say that if there's anything that we ought to be aware of and helping you with, let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for your comment. We're very interested in that. The congressman is working on some things relative to immigration to try and improve that whole process. And, and uh, uh, that will be for, or ongoing. He's also, uh, there's some legislation that will be coming to the House for this week in regard to veterans benefits for those that have been exposed to hazardous uh, materials. And, uh, and then the Ukraine situation, uh, he's made a statement that he believes that the whole world ought to get involved in that and uh, put an end to it, and uh, that we're dealing with a real evil person uh, in terms of Mr. Putin. Those are the things that, uh, that I've got today, so thank you. Thanks. Great to hear from you, Larry. Thanks for all of you in the Congress, uh, Congressman's work. All right, if I could ask you to mute now, thank you very much. Good to hear from you. Someone else needs to mute. It, it's Larry, Mary. Hi, Larry. Um, oh. Mary, I thought you might mention that federal bill we're interested in. I'm looking for the number or the information right now, but I can't find it. Yes, so what was that bill number? Uh, uh, it was by a Montana. I'll, I'll send the information to John Curtis's office tomorrow right. or, or after the meeting. Well, or, or, or email it to me. You've got my email, just the number, and I'll certainly look into it and get back to you. Okay. Thank you, Larry. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. All right. Were there any other citizens that uh, would like to make public comment tonight? at this time. All right, seeing none, you're always welcome to write the commission an email, commission at grandcountyutah.net. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll go ahead and carry on here to um, item F, approving volunteer appointment to the Kenyanlands Healthcare Special Service District Board. That's myself, Chair Wojtek. Um, Oops, on the agenda summary, it says Jacques 
uh, Chair Wojtek is the commission liaison for the board. Um, and as presented here, um, the, the Healthcare Special Service District met in an open meeting on February, on 10 of February, 2022, reviewed one application um, for four open vacancies as of 1231, interviewed the applicants and we voted unanimous, unanimously to recommend um, Joette Langanese for reappointment. Um, and I do believe that, yeah, she's, um, she's still an at, kind of an at-large citizen um, seat on that board, um, you know, despite her now being um, with, with the city and that board also having a city representative. Um, but with her background and her vast knowledge of the workings of the care center, it's um, pretty vital to have her in, um, on that board. Um, any questions? I'll make a motion to approve the appointment of Joette Langanese to the special, the Canyonlands Health Care Special Service District with the term expiring 12 31 2025. Thank you, Mary. Do I have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Hadler. Any further discussion? We had a motion by McGann, a second by Hadler. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. That vote passes unanimously six to nothing. Moving, item, moving on to item G, got lots to talk about. Attorney Sloan, this is the legislative update for the 2022 general session. Let's start um, with this HB 146 language um, that Senator Bramble just released. We had gotten even maybe 10 days ago word that this was gonna happen. Um, Senator Bramble said he would share the language with us in advance. Of course he did not. Um, that was true of the city and the county, um, but we got it when it went live online. We've of course been tracking it and waiting for this. Um, I'm gonna try to screen share. Um, quickly, just so y'all can see how very bad it is. Um, I think you're looking at a red line here. This is chapter 65, all-terrain vehicle regulation. Um, there's actually, so this is within HB 146, which was um, existing legislation that's already passed the House, is now in the Senate, to regulate food trucks slightly differently. Um, we already didn't like this bill. We already opposed it, I think, the very first legislative update. Um, but now it just got a lot worse. So he's inserted, there's actually some additional um, limiting language above, but the meat is here, this chapter 65. And what this basically says is a city or county can't do anything that we have done um, to attempt to uh, regulate noise in our residential areas through our Title V businessing regulations. This includes both our existing regulations that of course have been on the book since April of last year and also the proposed regulations um, that we discussed about a month ago. Um, clearly there was local lobbying of Senator Bramble. This is a last minute amendment. There are three days left. What would ha have to happen now is the Senate would have to adopt this, approve it, and then it would have to go back to the House for approval. Um, we have we had initiated a letter writing campaign already to the Senate because we expected this language to drop. I had several senators engage me, respond and say, you have the wrong bill. This is about food trucks. And that was a good moment to say, no, we're expecting this amendment from Bramble. Please look out for it. But I didn't get any real engagement from anyone on the substantive issue. Um, I have no idea how reasonable, how worried we need to be. But of course, this means everything to um, a huge component of this community. Um, I didn't see, and maybe the commission did send letters to the senators. I saw a ton from the community. Um, the community certainly turned out to write to the Senate. I didn't see any of my commissioners do that. So I certainly hope you will do that now. Um, now the stakes- I have a letter. Great, thank you, Mary. Now the um, stakes you know, do include the House. And so I had encouraged previously um, that we focus on the Senate, but now that we have even less time left, I think we need to um, you know, expand that letter writing campaign to the Senate and the House. I'm gonna be speaking, I'm gonna call Carly later tonight at the city. Um, she's speaking with Casey. I'm going to speak with Cody. We're also going to see what else we could do. Um, we might need to get some folks up there in person. I know Carly was going to um, head up tomorrow anyway, so I'll be in touch on that. I don't know that I can make that work in my schedule, but hopefully a couple of people could. Um, 
this is an illegal restraint on our um, police power and our regulatory power. So even if this passes, one, you know, the legislature doesn't actually care what's illegal and what's not. So that isn't going to matter in terms of whether it passes or not. Um, so, you know, we might have a big fight on our hands um, to strike down the law in the courts over the next year. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, or it might be something that we try to work with Cody in the interim um, to make some movement on this um, and also the city and, and their lobbyist if we think there's any hope there. Uh, Bramble is a very powerful senator and I would say at least in the Senate, he um, this is a technique that he's famous for and often his amendments get passed without question. Um, I don't know what that means for the House. So, so I need to, to find out a lot more, but it's certainly quite scary. Um, and after the exhaustion of the general session, it is certainly a big bummer. So I'll be in touch with you guys on that, um, but that is an urgency. Um, otherwise, um, some good news. We've been working really hard. Jacques's been a good partner on that, on a, a, what was a bad e-bike bill and then attempted to open up all of our dirt trails in Moab to e-bikes. Um, there was some language about disability access, but disability groups across the state have actually opposed this bill, said that um, they are not facing discrimination on trails and that the, this is not about the disabled community. And in fact, that they are less protected when you have bad policy that opens up um, trails to e-bikes and other motorized uses, um, using the disability community as, um, you know, a red hair, herring or whatever term you want to use um, because it it means more users on the trail. We've worked really hard, like 10 hours probably, and we had some really great allies in some other cities and counties, and we were able to, one, get an exemption for all federal trails. Um, obviously, that's a jurisdictional issue, but it would have created a lot of confusion. So the final draft that's going to go and get adopted um, is going to include an exemption for our federal trails. And then I also was amended dramatically to um, be a planning missive only. So it requires that we, when we are planning into constructing trails that we consider access and accommodations for disabled folks. And we also updated um, the definition of mobility disabled persons to actually be consistent, consistent with federal disability law because um, as written initially by Senator Weiler, it's extremely broad. Didn't really have anything to do with truly disabled people. Um, there's a couple, two new, pretty good new housing bills. I'm asking you to support 462, 474. I won't spend time going through them. They're very dense. But overall, they tell us that inclusionary housing is good and it should be used as one of the strategies. So overall, it's good. Mary testified in support of 462. We have heard some bad news that the, the original version that we liked might get stripped of some of our inclusionary language. But at this point, that, that substitute hasn't dropped. So I'm still recommending support of those two bills for now. And then I'm asking you to oppose House Bill 303, which is a bad inclusionary housing bill um, that con conflicts with the other two. It's kind of a race to the end. Um, it is possible that HB 303 passes as well, but they two um, pretty much inherently conflict with each other. Um, they're really focused on affordable, affordable housing and not workforce housing, though. So there might be some movement forward. These are the bills that, depending on what how they get adopted, um, I'm going to be recommending some urgent moves forward on inclusionary housing in the future. So I'll let you guys know about that as soon as the general session closes. And I think there's no urgency on that federal bill. Y'all certainly could um include the federal bill if you can find that email i couldn't find it just now um and add that into the motion but i am asking you to support house bills 462 and 474 and oppose house bill 303. and the, those weren't pre previously on our list no they're new it's the late numbers and 303 i wasn't tuned into um before the last meeting until now um Thank are, you. are we ready for a motion I, um, before we make that motion, it's um, the Gateway Community and Recreation Enhancement Act appears to be um, Senate Bill 3551. So if you wouldn't mind including that in your motion. And that's a federal well bill, federal bill. So Correct. you might want to mention federal SB 3551. You said Senate 3551? Correct. Okay. So I move to report. Utah State House Bills 462 and 474 and oppose 
House Bill 303 and also support um, U.S. Senate Bill 3551 and authorize the chair to sign any necessary letters of opposition or support to Utah legislators or federal legislators deemed necessary by the county legislative committee or county attorney. All right, that was a motion by Commissioner Walker. Do I have a second? I'll second that one. Second by Hadler. Any further discussion? Um, I, I just wanted, might have one other time to say it, but um, thank you very much, Christina, for all the close attention you've been paying to all these bills. It's really, you know, to say it always scares me, so I'm glad someone's waiting in there and getting things done. So I, I'm sure I speak for all of us. And we say we're very appreciative. And I oftentimes text as opposed to email. I seem to get responses back from uh, Hankins, Watkins, and, and uh, Albrecht faster if I text as opposed to uh, uh, emailing. So that's why you haven't seen. That's and great. And that is true. I think text is a great way to do it. Um, I, just, I just got done texting uh, Hankins and asking if him to oppose, if not the bill, at least the amendments. All right, thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm not seeing any further discussion. So we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner Walker, a seconded by Commissioner Hadler. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Vote, vote passes unanimously, six to zero. And we'll cruise right along here to item H. That's approving bid award for mobile stage and associated purchase agreement. Mallory Nassau, Commission Administrator. Yeah, um, I think I sent something earlier. I'm covering this for him. And I know you all have heard about this one before. So it did go out to bid. We received one submission. And uh, this is something that going forward with, we'll have to figure out some of the details but it's my understanding that we won't have the stage until maybe November of this year. So um, those are on the radar and we are, Chris is working on the initial steps of, um, you know, storage. Is there an awning that's needed um, to keep it protected? Yada, yada. And I shouldn't say yada, yada, because it is a lot of money, but um, just know that those are in the works and that the city has also um, firmed up their contrib contribution, sorry. And um, so are there any questions that I can attempt to answer or dig in and get you an answer to? I don't know if it's a question, but it, it's a comment. Um, I know that, and I don't know if it's Chris, but that it was going to be housed at OSTA and they don't really have a place for it, at least a protected place for it. So they were then trying to, you know, start talking about building something to, to house this thing. So it is a bigger monster than we thought. Just throwing that out. Yes, and I think um, that's kind of what Chris was speaking to is building something at OSTA, nothing fancy, but yeah, those are on the radar. I don't know if that helps, but. <laughs> Does it come with a, um, a trailer or something? Is it, like, how is it movable? Oh. Yeah, it looks like it, it looks like it's contained in a trailer. Um, yeah, and the, the information in the packet, it, it looks super cool. It looks like a, like a really neat modular unit um, and it's, yeah, very transportable. And, yeah, at first I was like, what? But then, yeah, if you look at the packet, Sarah, it kind of shows how it moves and it's it's pretty impressive. It is very, I, I, I actually got <laughs> deep into the into the packet with, with that. It was fun. I think it'll be a great asset. I do too. Well, if there's an, not any further discussion, I would entertain a motion or further like questions. Uh, I'd like to make that motion, Gabe. Um, I, move, I move to award the bid for a mobile stage to Stageline Mobile Stage Incorporated for a price not to exceed $161,590 and approve a contract for such contingent upon approval of the purchasing agent and county attorney. Motion by Hadler. Do I have a second? 
I second. Seconded by McGann. And is there actually any further discussion? One more opportunity for that. Seeing on a call for a vote, all those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote, aye. Passes, aye. vote passes unanimously, six to nothing. Um, at this moment, I'm going to um, pass the reins over to the vice chair for item I. And I'm going to um, abstain from discussion and from voting unless otherwise prompted. All right. Uh, thank you, Gabe. So we're on to agenda item I, which is approving the clerk auditor midterm vacancy appointment. Um, we have two applicants, uh, uh, Rachel Stenta, and uh, as Gabe just mentioned, uh, Gabriel Wojtek, uh, who you all know very well as our commission chair chairman. Um, in the packet, there are uh, letters from each of them. I um, guess I will uh, open it up to discussion. Um, sure, I'll, I'll say something. Um, first, I, I think we're lucky to have you know two well qualified advocates. I, you know, in a small county like our ours, it's sometimes it's hard to fill important positions like this. And I think it's really great that I, I think we've got two people, both of whom I think are definitely capable of doing the job. Um, I think Rachel's um, you know, resume is, is, is very much relevant to the job and there's a lot of relevant experience there. Um, I've gotten to know Gabe over the past year or so and I think he's a very smart and capable guy and, and definitely works well with others, which I, you know, being in county government, I'm more and more realizing how important that is. Um, I, I think this would be a really tough decision for me if for the interim appointment, if both people were, were ready to start right away. But my understanding from Rachel's letter and multiple sources is she's not able to start until August 1st. And I, I just think it's better given budgeting and given the election that's happened, happening that we have continuous leadership, and, and I think in the long run, you know, ultimately, starting in 2023, the voters are going to decide um, who's going to be the clerk in the long run. And I think no matter what they decide, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a better, you know, we'll have a good clerk. So feeling good about that. Um, but may, if it's okay, I, I would move to um, find the right language. Um, I move, move to appoint Gabriel Wojtek to fill the midterm vacancy of the Grand County Clerk Auditor and swear him in as, into the office as interim clerk auditor. Uh, I have a motion from Kevin. Uh, is there a second? I'll second that. All right, uh, discussion. And it looks like uh, both Rachel and Gabriel are with us. Um, I think if anyone has any questions for either of them, uh, it would be appropriate to uh, ask them. Um, any uh, further discussion at this time? No, I'll just I'll just parrot what Kevin said. And, and I do think it's imperative that we get somebody in there right away um, because we have to kind of extract as much information out of Quinn and Jana as we can, you know, at, at, just to make that as seamless as possible, so. And I would just like to say that I worked with Rachel when I was a poll watcher, when we had poll watchers before mail in and I, she was incredibly professional, thorough, and I know she has every capabilities and my experience with Gabriel has uh, been wonderful over the, the last few years that I've had the pleasure of working with him, especially when he was my vice chair. He's a quick study, he's a hard worker. And what so often this uh, position goes without any, you know, that only one person applies and there's very, really, very rarely competition and to have competition with two very capable human beings is, is exceptional for a small community. 
like ours. And I want to thank you both for your willingness to step up to the plate. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say a little bit more. I, I, I have got, you know, I do think Gabe is a very um, capable and smart person who I, I think will do great at the job. I dealt with Rachel a bit during the 2015 city elections, and I, I thought that election was was run very professionally and you know, no, no complaints at all with um, dealing with Rachel during that period. All right. Yeah. And, and I agree. I, I think Rachel's resume is extremely impressive. I, I don't know her personally. I've also had a great experience working with Gabe and uh, this would be a difficult vote for me. Um, but uh, it looks like Rachel wouldn't be able to, would only be able to um, uh, come on for about half of the uh, appointed term. And I agree that, that getting someone into the clerk auditor position is is uh, expediency is important for that as well. Um, any other any other discussion or any other questions? Jacques, um, this is Mallory, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I did the agenda summary, and I can't recall what it says exactly. Um, but it does need to speak more to the appointment effective date, which would be um, this Friday, March fourth. So more of a uh, move to appoint so-and-so as the interim clerk auditor effective March 4th. And then assuming that's Gabriel, it would be March 4th. If it's Rachel, it would be August 1st. And that would be the same uh, date as the swearing in. Sorry Thank if you. I created confusion. So Jacques, if it's not too late, could I just clarify that my in my motion, the effective date would be March 4th? Thank you, Kevin. Um, all right, I've got a motion on a table by Kevin and a second by Trish. Um, all in favor, raise their hand or say aye. Uh, Sarah, was did you vote on that? Not yet. I, I'm sorry, all opposed. <laughs> okay, uh, so in favor, we have um, a vote of four to one with Sarah opposed and uh, Gabriel abstaining. Uh, the motion passes. All right. Thanks for taking that on, Jacques, and, and, and thank you to the commission for your confidence in my abilities. Um, I'm really looking forward to jumping in immediately. Um, you know, and I mean, I, and I mean, tomorrow, you know, whether I'm sworn in or not, I think there will be opportunities for me to already become acquainted and I look forward to proving myself and um, making sure there aren't any gaps of service and making, making sure to help that our already um, awesome clerk office um, continues to run smoothly. So we'll move right on to the consent agenda. Um, item J, approving a tribal con consultation letter to the U Indian tribe of the Uinta and Ure Reservation regarding a HUD HUD Environmental Review for Housing Authority of Southeastern Utah Project funding. Item K, approving a tribal consultation letter to the Navajo Nation, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah regarding a HUD Environmental Review for Housing Authority of Southeastern Utah Project funding. And item L, approving a no historic properties affected finding letter to the State Historical Preservation Office regarding a HUD environmental review for Housing Authority of Southeastern Utah project funding. I would entertain a motion to approve the, uh, the consent agenda. I would move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thanks, Jacques. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any uh, second by Commissioner Walker. Any, um, any discussion? All right, seeing none, we had a motion by Hadler, second by Walker, call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. That vote passes unanimously, six to nothing. And it looks like all we have left here is the calendar. Mallory. All right, the highlight of everybody's night. It will be short as it always is. So 
Um, August spoke to it um, as well as obviously planning and zoning, but they will have a public engagement workshop this Thursday at Sun Court, which is just outside of Star Hall. And that is from 4 to 6 p.m. They will serve pizza, so stop by if you can and tell others to attend. Um, let's see, the other fun thing that's about to get going is Team Rubicon is here, and they are going to officially run, I think it's March 10th through the 18th, but I know Osta is busy getting everything set up and ready to hit the ground running. Um, we spoke in a meeting yesterday about the potential of having a commission meeting. It's my understanding that pre-COVID, when there were the three potential commission meetings in the month, that those third ones <laughs> would be either joint meetings or ones that the commission would have for items that come up. And we did discuss that possibility. So I'm not sure... Uh, if you all want to move forward with that right now or just send out an email, but I wanted to get that on the radar. And my goodness, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but that's all that I have unless there's any questions. So you were discussing a, a meeting on the 29th of March, Mallory? Yes, yes. So I think um, that would tie to maybe Kevin could speak to it or Sarah or Trish about the potential small, um, I'm sorry, the words are escaping me. Kevin's got it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I faded out for a second. What, what am I supposed to be remembering here? <laughs> um, the potential we talked about for if planning and zoning has something for the commission to consider with the um, Book Cliffs area. Yeah, so so I thought that was um, likely to be discussed in it. I think is it April fourth? Is that a Tuesday? Our first meeting in April. So, uh, I thought it came up as a discussion for the potential of having it at that meeting. Third we, did, we did discuss it just as an option, um, but it it does seem like the timeline would be fine if if we did the first meeting in April. Okay, that sounds good. I'm sure everybody's happy to hear that. So disregard all of that and outside of that- Unless I'm misremembering. <laughs> no, no, I support what you guys remember. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all I have unless there's questions. Um, could you speak to the open house thing that's happening on Thursday? Yes, so there will be I didn't attend the last one at the Grand Center, but it's my understanding there will be various tables set up. Um, I know Multicultural Center will be there um, August for economic development and um, just a few stations for the public to come and learn about what's going on, but also give um, some feedback on the general plan and where things are at and just that, that continued push to get folks to, to speak up and to realize what the general plan really is um, and how it guides the community. So it is more of just that come out, learn and share your, your input and your thoughts on, on the development of the plan. Trish, do you have anything you would clarify? I know you're a part of those meetings. I think you did a great job, Mallory. Thank you. And pizza at 5.30 is what John told me. <laughs> no, uh, go ahead, Mary. I do think it would be really uh, beneficial, a good idea if, uh, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know if it's uh, who's kind of running the uh, Rubicon, Team Rubicon, but I think it would be appropriate for one or two or three commissioners to go out and welcome them and thank them for coming. So I think that's a good idea. we should just make sure that happens. What, what was what was the first day that they were going to be in town again, Mallory? I have it down as March 10th and I can confirm that and just send you all an email. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. yeah they're going to, it's, they're going to do a lot of benefit. It's going to, it's a great thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, de depending on the topic, right. I could I could be one of the people who. I'd be happy to do that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would. And they're veterans. Yeah, so yeah, three of us go or two of us go or whomever. I think it'd be really nice thing to do to just let them know how thankful they're and thank them for their service because they're all veterans and most of them are dealing with issues from being a veteran and thank them for all the work they're going to be volunteering to do in our community. Go okay. on their website. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive if you haven't yet. Mary, did you have any, oh, oh sorry, go ahead, Jean. Oh, I had one more question about tomorrow. John sent out a, a, a slew of invitations for uh, tomorrow and I, I was a little bit unclear as to what that was, if it was the event that got canceled with Bigo or if it was something else. Let me check right now. I did some emailing with him about it because I was also unclear. Um, I guess the line, the bill that did that presentation for us last week is in town and he'll be in there for from like 10.30 to 2.30 or whatever. So he said, pick a time, let us know if you can, if not, just come into the office at some point to talk about things during that time. Was, was, okay. was he requesting that we come in to talk or was it just if we had specific questions about the process? Or... Um, I think it was a request. Okay. Well, maybe, um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind, maybe the latest um, sort of intel that you got from John that was clarifying that, if you wouldn't mind forwarding that along to us, so we're all just kind of on the same page there. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm thinking that I'll probably be down by the office um, anyway, most of the day tomorrow. Um, great. Thanks for thanks for alerting to that. I, um, and then Mary, um, was there any updates on a, a tour of the USU facility at this moment? No, I haven't. I haven't since, the, since two o'clock, I haven't looked at my email, but I'm sure there's, uh, Mallory, do we? Has there been a time set? I do not know. I saw an email from Leanna about uh, if there was a final time set for tomorrow or if there was something that could be sorted out for next week. I just uh, didn't have the time to get back to her or follow up. Okay, no worries. Sounds like that. Maybe that would be for next week then. Maybe if we can circle back around. Maybe that. we should. We, we, uh, maybe, uh, could you set out a doodle poll to the commissioner? So, because we've been kind of flaky on this, so that we can get a time and tell her when we have show up. Yeah, maybe um, I'll start with. The options that she has because it might just be a few and then send something out tomorrow and we'll go from there if that works. Yes, that's because I, 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 I've dropped the ball on it a couple of times and it's, yeah, I think it's important. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, well, if there aren't any other um, items with regards to calendar and our schedule, I will go ahead and um, close this meeting at 6.43 p.m. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Have a great night. Thanks, you guys.